Call to order the special meeting of the Westmont Village Board on um, April 25th, 24 at 4:30 p.m. And roll for call will be by observation. Um, at this point, would everybody please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States, United States of America and, and to the republic, republic for which it stands, stands one nation under God. God indivisible with liberty and justice for all just a couple uh, comments we always have open forum um, but while the, if you want to address the board for something other than the budget now's the time but as the budget is being presented if you want to say anything get our attention and then we can answer that because it is open to the public um, and this budget and there uh, Spencer is going to explain it is a 20 month budget because we're, we're going to fiscal year so it's eight months and then it'll be a 12 month so it's kind of new for us but they worked real hard on it uh, and every year we do this presentation and over, overview we streamlined it to where it's pretty easy to follow and I'm going to turn this over to our assistant village manager, manager Spencer Parker I just want to start by Thanking everybody for all of the work that went into this budget. It's a long process that started months ago with departments and many people in each department all working to put together the analysis, to put together the recommendations and the requests, and to go through all of that, that work. And it all comes together tonight where we'll go through kind of the highlights, but there's countless hours that all the departments and their staffs have put into this budget. I will say as always that the requests are all good, reasonable. We've got great department heads, they're great stewards of the public funds and public trust and we're really grateful for them. I will also say that Nick this year, our interim finance director has done a tremendous job in putting all this together and talking with the departments and building all of the pieces of the spreadsheets and making it all flow and fit together well. So I really appreciate him and all the effort that he's done. Um, and he'll get a chance to say a few words. We also thank you, the board, in advance for listening to this whole presentation and for your guidance and direction in holding us to good high fiscal standards and making sure that we are using the money well to get the best services to our citizens. What's the update on the finance director's position? We're so 30 seconds into this meeting and you're already I'm, No, I, I, <laughs> I said I wouldn't ask the question, but for the public, we got to interview. We expect to have the position filled probably late May, mid-June. Good. Good. Thank you. Yep. And I will turn it over to Nick for a little bit. Okay. I, I don't know if you wanted to make any comments, Steve, or... Well, I, yes, thank you. I mean, it was uh, well put in the process, uh, you know, that we're doing. Uh, for you all, you've all been to, you know, annually. We participate in a budget workshop or the presentation before... Uh, you actually act on it at a future meeting and in this particular case it would be next week um, we do this every year uh, mayor started that it was uh, different and in that we're kind of doing either depending on how you look at it we're doing two budgets an eight and a 12 or a 20-month budget and for the purposes of staff and everybody that had to work on it 
always do an excellent job every year and uh, and you know more so this year but you know a 20 month forecast uh, that they've already been working on for several months coming up in today so um, the mayor mentioned the fiscal year we're changing from a May 1 fiscal year to a calendar year uh, is what the purpose of that staggered budget is so I'm pretty proud of everybody in the room and what they've done they, they do it well every year but there was a you know a lot of good work and and working with the you know new but interim finance director too and I'll just let you take it from there and your experience but um, you know heard a lot of good things right um, as as was said you're going from a fiscal year budget to a calendar year budget and that's always a difficult thing to do uh, find it interesting you know for nerds like me who do these kinds of things and it was a lot of interesting comp comp uh, uh, processes we had to follow <clears throat> In the past, whenever I address the board in public, I always sing the praises of the finance department. And you got a very good staff there. But this gave me the opportunity to work with all the department heads and all their supervisors. And um, uh, I just wanted you to know I get into a lot of communities. And you have a very knowledgeable staff here, department heads, supervisory staff. Uh, every time I asked for information, I got it. I got it in detail, never had any problems. Uh, there was one time uh, somebody responded to me like within minutes and I called him back and said couldn't you get me this any quicker and they started saying well geez I had to do this one thing I said no I was just joking you know uh, but everything I got I got it on a timely basis um, the uh, uh, you know the detail and intricacies that they know about their jobs about overtime about commodities and contractuals uh, very very impressive for me for someone to come in on the outside and and look at that I got no calls uh, nobody late submitting, uh, no manager had to settle arguments between any departments or, or with me, uh, no big issues, and um, no calls from elected officials, and that's kind of odd for me. So uh, again, your, your system uh, works very well, and as an organization, you respect the council manager form of government, which isn't true in, in a lot of communities that I get in. Much easier for a consultant like me and staff people to work in that type of environment <clears throat> and it always works best that way and uh, I just wanted to congratulate all of you I I you know I, I always get calls from from elected officials and I don't think I've had a conversation with any of you other than what, when I was at the podium so uh, that works out very well yeah I know that takes uh, years of doing and uh, and again I want to thank Span uh, Spencer he was very gracious with his time and, and for me, and putting all this together, your department heads were. And uh, Steve, it's been a pleasure to work with your, your staff and to work with the organization. So thanks very much. And I think you're going to make some opening comments, and then I'll jump in. So thank you all, everyone in the room. Sure. So we're going to go over briefly what we'll cover. And then as we do it, we're going to do a brief overview of the budget and our process. We'll do a financial overview, and then we'll go into some of the highlights of the revenue, the money that comes in, and then the expenses, the money that goes out as we're providing these services to the residents, and then we'll do the conclusion. So as was talked about, we are changing our fiscal years, and so we're moving from a fiscal year that starts in May to one that starts in January. It'll be a lot easier to know what year we're talking about. We'll only have to use one year instead of two years, the time to explain it. But this year in the transition, it's a little bit tricky and that we've got two budgets. So we have an eight-month budget that goes from May through December, and then we have a 12-month budget that goes from January through December. And the plan is we're going to be approving both of the budgets together, so we're talking through them in this budget as if it's like a 20-month budget. You'll see some references breaking out the eight versus the 12, especially when we're trying to do some comparisons. But then when we cover the highlights of everything that's in the budget, in those cases, we'll just be taking it all as a whole as if it were a 20-month budget. And here on the slide, you can see in general how the 8 and the 12 months broke out because not all revenue is consistent, not all expenses are consistent. There's some things that happen at different times of the year. I will say that was an extra big piece for our departments to go through and think about all of their expenses, not just how many expenses do you have over the course of a year, but for those expenses, which ones happened before December or after December? and kind of breaking those out into those different methods. So at the end of it, it turned out that our eight-month budget came in about 67%. So 67% is what we'd expect. 
Our revenues ended up being about 71% and our expenses ended up being about 69%. So right about what we would expect. As the board's familiar with, we have some priorities that are identified in our strategic plan and then also we've identified a few other priorities to make sure we cover when we talk budgets. The ones that are listed vertically on the right hand side are the ones that are identified in the strategic plan. The ones that are listed horizontally are the ones that we wanted to make sure we talked about during budget time. And the purple ones that are in both the column and the row were listed on both the budget priorities as well as the long-term priorities. Now I will say in terms of budgets, it's a little bit different this year. In the past years, we have had every expense broken out and chartered and applied into these different categories. I will say that's generated some confusion, especially for some things like public safety that don't as easily fit into something like identity and image. It's not intuitive. Hmm. And so this year, when we talk about what's included in the budget and the highlights, we are going to go through and kind of identify those by the priorities. But in terms of looking at our funds and our overall financial picture, we're not looking at all of it through the strategic plan priorities, but kind of just looking at it more on a financial overview. So that's a little bit of a difference. As a brief budgeting 101, I will say a couple of years ago, we went into a lot more depth at an admin finance committee meeting, but this time I'll just do briefly, there's a few different kinds of funds. Our general fund covers all of our major operations. So when we talk about the general fund, that's the one where we're talking about the vast majority of our services. So police, fire, our public works crews that are out working on the trees and the roads, the people that are crunching the numbers, all of that is covered under the general fund. We do have a water fund, which is a separate enterprise fund, and it's got a function on its own, almost as if it were a business, like a water utility. And then we've got several other funds for some different specific purposes, including capital. There are one of the big differences between some of these different kinds of funds and piece we talk about a lot is the idea of recurring versus one time. So when we're looking at what we want to spend, we're always careful if we're doing any expenses that are going to be recurring that happen year after year, we're covering those with revenues that will also come in year after year. So we don't want to dip into our savings account to provide our usual month-to-month -month living expenses. But at the same time, we have some funds where we've set aside some money for some big major projects. You know, at, at home, I may set aside money to cover refrigerators when they break or those kind of things. Here, we're setting aside millions of dollars to cover things like road repairs and not just repairs, but building new roads and those kinds of infrastructure projects. So in many of the funds, other than the general fund, you'll see that we have, we have a lot that we're spending out of money that we've saved up. And so you'll see the net that happens each year is a negative and that makes sense because we're using that money for these infrastructure projects. We also build out some fund balance targets. So when we get to the financial piece, we'll be sharing with you our targets. And we've got listed here kind of how we calculated our targets for these different, different funds. So now we'll get into the financial overview and I'm gonna turn it over to Nick to kind of talk through, talk through that. You also, I've got on, on the slides, but you, the board member should also have a piece of paper that's got all that stuff and you might be able to see it. Maybe a little better on the paper than you can on the screen. I just wanted to begin by um, kind of uh, navigating through this chart a little bit. And I think this is the most complicated chart we have, but you had a complicated issue. You're doing 20, 20 month budget and you had to separate it between an eight month and a 12. We also have the targets here, and you also have some fund balance issues that uh, uh, that you're going to be dealing with. So, along the left-hand side, that left-hand column there, uh, you could see that um, those are the different funds. And uh, Spencer had alluded to a few of them. We operate under a fund accounting system. Those of you in the corporate world, uh, you don't have different funds. You have one balance sheet. Each one of these funds has a separate balance sheet. It's like a separate company, uh, if you will. And, uh, and if you look across that top line, you can see that there's a beginning balance. Each one of the funds has a beginning cash balance and it is segregated for special uses in that fund. And then you could see that we separated in a box by the eight month budget and a 12 month budget. Real hard to compare to previous year. Uh, we could talk about that in a bit. But then each one, the eight month and a 12 month, as you could see, will have its revenue, expense, difference, and an ending fund balance. And uh, 
So the 12 month is very similar to the eight month. That's the next line over. Bottom line, if you go to the bottom lines, you could see, now I know you get questions all the time about what's your total budget for the village. Eight month budget on that bottom line is 57 million 600. 12 month budget is 85 million, or 84 million, but that, that went much higher because you could look up the, um, uh, right across from water, there's a substantial amount of water projects you're gonna be doing. You're getting a grant, you know, you've talked about that at some, at some length for the uh, North Water Tower, you'll be doing a Central Water Tower. So that's really what drives that up. But, but your annual budget for the following 12 month year would be 85 million in total. General fund, that's pretty similar to what it normally is. As Spencer said, in the eight month budget general, you follow that across 25 million 700. And if you look at the 12 month budget, it's, 80, it's 37 million. 30, five, six, seven is where you've been running uh, on, your, on your general fund. Now that last column is the target. And uh, as Spencer had said, uh, that's something that you have to be aware of in the condition that, in the position you're in right now. Uh, you've got to th kind of think about your credit rating agencies. Right now you have a double A plus credit rating. Out of 21, you're number two. And you could move to number three and that takes a lot of work and a lot of time. And, and should you be managing the finances of the organization based on what they say? No. You know, you got to base the finances on what your needs are. But you should always keep that common thread that how does this affect our credit rating? You certainly don't want to go down. And uh, you want to make the necessary steps to increase. And what does that relate to? It relates to some, some changes and some uh, differences in what your rates will be when you start borrowing. And if you're doing a long-range capital planning like you'll be doing in the next several years, 15 to 20 basis points, maybe 25, in the rates that you'll be charged over a 30-year period, which winds up being uh, a lot of money. But more importantly, that's, that rating is the only barometer that you have that tells the community and everyone how well managed you are. Okay, you're second from the best right now. There aren't too many that are AAA. And, and you have, a, I think, an opportunity to do that. And you have the most difficult pieces. You have the EAV. Your EAV is a lot higher than you think compared to a lot of communities in DuPage County. If you take out some of the anomalies, you know, you're about ninth out of 36, which is really good. And you've got a solid base. Now, all these towns that have these uh, high rises and um, offices, which are empty right now, they're going to have some difficulties to deal with. You have a really good, solid base of, you know, uh, uh, very expensive housing, uh, you know, just first time housing buyers, uh, commercial. You have a good, good uh, multifamily, so you have a real good base and a real good mix. Uh, so anyway, it's just something that, that's the most difficult thing to change. I get into communities, I can't have them change their EAV, that takes 30 or 40 years. But, but you're in a position to where you could do that. So um, you're, you, like I said, you're about a billion dollars. You're in an affluent county to begin with, in DuPage. We've had some increases in the real estate market. So what the, uh, what the credit rating agencies look for is they all, they'll always say we want to see 25% of your annual expenses, um, but they like to see 50. Now, you, right now in your general fund, you're about 150, but you're going to be doing a capital plan. You're going to be spending that down, and you got to spend it down on a gradual basis, and you'll be doing that. Well, you'll take so much out of your fund balance, transferring so much over, doing some projects. As long as you do that and you don't do it all in one lump sum, you're good. So you just got to think that through all the time. And uh, as I said, you're much higher uh, than, than they're requiring right now. But you never want to go below that 50% because that's really what keeps you in that elite group in your operating funds. And to your operating funds, that would be your general, your water and sewer, maybe your convention and tourism. Uh, but again, that's something you could spend down and nobody's going to squawk about. That's, that's stuff you should be spending to try and increase visits to your community. So anyway, that last column there is the targets, and it's kind of a new thing that, you'll, that you should be looking at every year. And, uh, and just to, uh, to make sure you, that you don't go too far below that in any of your planning, it's always a good thing. If you could uh, keep that at 50% and still spend some of your fund balance, uh, that's a good thing to report when you go before your credit rating agencies. But as I said, you, know, you, you don't want to live by the targets that they set for you because you have other priorities in your organization. But again, what they try and do is to keep you safe. They try and keep you a good investment. So you know, when you go into the credit markets, yes, they're AAA, they're a very good investment. And uh, just like you would when you make any of your own investments, 
you know, you want to go with the companies that are solid, that have good cash balances, have a good history, and are financially managed very well. So, uh, okay. Any questions on uh, how we got this set up? We tried to make a complicated issue as simple as we could, and um, I hope, uh, you know, we could, and I hope there's no, you know, issues about that. So we're okay with it? Anybody? Okay. Seeing none, go ahead. We're okay. Uh, the next one, uh, next item I wanted to cover was that graph right below. And again, all we're trying to point out here, now you're going to see a similar graph every year. So for your eight-month expenses or eight-month budget and your 12-month budget, you're going to see these, uh, uh, these same percentages. So out of your entire budget, out of all of those funds that were on the left side of that, of that chart, these are how the percentages break out. Your general fund is about uh, 45%. And, uh, and then your water fund is about 16, which is very common. You know, you have your service-oriented organization, and those are the things that, um, you know, that you're going to see. You're going to see a lot of money spent on personnel. The only thing, and we'll allude to it later, too, is that uh, your uh, IMRF, FICA, and Medicare actually come out of a different fund. So you can actually add a portion of those. Now, water pays their portion, their fair share portion of that. But uh, your general fund, you could add about $1.5 million of that. You do it that way because it has a separate levy. That's fine to do it that way. It's easy to audit that way. So uh, any questions on the chart itself? That's how the funds break down. Okay, we could move on to that uh, special purpose fund. And... Um, Special purpose funds, again, uh, that's just what uh, the name implies. And uh, you, have, you have your debt service fund. You have five outstanding bond issues. You never issue a levy for your, um, uh, for your bonds. Uh, and, uh, and they're all paid. So you have a statutory limit on the amount of money that you could, you could issue in bonds. And I believe it's about $85 million for you. And you guys are at zero, which is you can't get much better than that. And, um, uh, so you don't have any bonds that you actually levy for. You use your general revenue to abate those every year and pay those off. The DEA fund is the asset forfeiture fund, and money is distributed based on the assets that are forfeited in a, in a drug case. And there's a limited use for expending those funds. So you, gave it, you garner a fund balance in those, and then public safety folks determine what they could spend that on based on what the statutes allow. IMRF is just as I had indicated, that you have a separate levy for that portion of your benefits. The rest of your benefits, health insurance, AD&D, uh, dental, life, those are all in your general fund but, uh, and, and the water and sewer fund. But you do have these benefits, the retirement benefits that are here, and that totals about $1.5 million. Convention and tourism, as I mentioned, you have to use that money to promote tourism, conventions, special events, to promote visits to the community. And uh, you bring in about 600 grand a year, and you do it the right way, where you just send that somewhere where that is done, where a lot of communities try and distribute some of that to their general operations. And here you don't do that. You know, you do that for what the statute intended it for, which is, and you do have a lot of events here that people, people come to, and uh, and and that's you know, and that's just how that is used. I think a little bit of salary is charged to those accounts, and then the next one is uh, vehicles. And uh, the actual purchases, Spencer will go over in a later slide. Uh, but you have a fully funded vehicle replacement program. You go over the, the amount that's, the amount of money that's held in reserve every year. You charge the departments every year appropriately based on the value of those vehicles. So you go through an extensive process where you increase the, the you, you, you bring in the actual cost of the vehicle every year. And then that's what you use to calculate the annual expense to your, to your departments. And that's the way it should be done. So when I say it's fully funded, uh, it's like any type of funded plan that you're paying into every year. So that at the end of the useful life of each one of those vehicles, you have enough money to, to buy it and to pay for it and replace it. So again, it's, uh, it's fully funded and it's charged annually. Any questions on special purpose? On the uh, capital funds, uh, you have a capital projects fund here. Spencer will cover some of those. Same thing in Storm. The difference is in Storm, you have a dedicated revenue stream 
going into that. And I believe it's the sales tax, the additional sales tax. <coughs> uh, motor fuel tax, MFT, uh, that's a tax collected on fuel by the state of Illinois. It's distributed per capita back to the municipalities. And we'll cover some of those as well, basically used for road projects. Your TIF districts, your Southwest, and your Central Business District. That t Southwest Business District is starting to earn, uh, is starting to earn, where you, you did some borrowings from that to actually do that. And it's just what you want to do. When you manage a TIF, you got these big projects, you borrow from somewhere, which you could because you have the cash. And, uh, and then once they start generating income, you start paying that back. And I think there was a couple million dollars that they had budgeted. You've already paid a million dollars back. You're going to be able to pay the rest of that back over the next two years. And uh, central business, you're actually doing, you're borrowing the money as well. What this shows is that you're working these, these TIF districts. I get in a lot of communities where, you know, they're earning like $3,000 a year or something like that. You're going in, you're saying, okay, we're going to invest in them. We're going to use our fund balance to go in to build something to build up the fund balance so that we could work work these and if a credit rating agency looked at that they would say good you know I'm glad you're investing and, uh, and that that preserves your EAV long term so any questions on uh, TIF for capital funds and in more detail coming later but this overview of the funds uh, yeah and then the uh, fund balance I covered, go ahead, why don't you okay. start? Either way. No, 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 go ahead. Sure, so I did want to kind of explain a little bit of, of a difference. The top bar there shows the same information we presented to you last year <clears throat> with our plans for our general fund and our long range planning fund. In the audit, they're all squished together into the general fund, but from our perspective, it's always been helpful to have a separate fund to say, here's the stuff we're saving for longer term projects. And so in the past, we said we're, our policy says we need to have at least 20% of fund balance. And so we just kept 20% in the general fund and had the rest in the long range planning. We said we wanted to keep another 10% in contingency. And then we did a lot of transferring and then had some left over in long range planning. This year, as Nick talked about, um, so Nick has talked about the importance of having about a 50% fund balance in the general fund and that that's what these rating agencies will look for and so what, the way we're looking now at our long-range planning fund is it's everything above that 50% instead of everything above the 20% so you can see we've got that 50% there then we're transferring quite a bit from our long-range planning fund into these different funds like our capital fund and our TIF funds and then the yellow shows the little bit we have remaining which is that balance of just about two million dollars yeah all I wanted to add is it's important to keep that 50% in your operating funds. And in your case, it's general and it's the water and sewer. And whenever you're doing borrowings or future capital, that's always a good mark to shoot for. If you get to 48, nobody's going to complain. But you, know, you don't want to get to 35. Uh, so you don't want to get to that point. So it's protecting you from revenue shortfalls, which happen all the time. Uh, there's no explaining some of this stuff, and you can't really prepare for it. Yeah, the, the only thing you could do is to do this and say, if something bad happens, we're going to have this revenue to operate. And, and Spencer, the general fund is kind of catch-all. The other funds specifically have to be used for that pur for those purposes. Yep. Yep, that's accurate. So you'll notice back on this capital fund slide that both the capital and the TIF happened to have their ending and their target be identical. That doesn't just happen that's how we make it happen and we make it happen by those transfers so that gray section from the long-range plan and so this shows what the long-range planning fund is transferring out to the different funds so you can see we're transferring about seven and a half million to capital and about three million to the TIF and we'll talk through when we cover the expense highlights we'll be talking about all those different things that are included in this budget which are covered by those transfers in addition typically the long-range planning fund will be transferring some back to the general fund to cover the one-time expenditures in the general fund. So we want to make sure that our recurring revenues cover our recurring expenses. And so we also record a transfer to cover the one-time costs. So those, again, be things we'll cover in more detail as we get down to the highlights of expenses. But things like facilities, improvements, facilities, repairs, things like you know computer systems, computer placement, some of those kinds of things are covered in the one-time costs. And so this year, so typically we would see, 
if we had two million of transfer, two million of one-time expenditures, we may see as much as two million dollars of transfers. This year, we're only transferring 541,000 because that's all that we needed, because the recurring revenues o only, cover all those only 500, revenues. Yeah, yeah. So cash. it's about a you know about a fourth of the two million, um, a little less than that, because we had so many revenues that came in, and especially in the eight-month budget. Because we get property taxes, as you know, you have to pay your property taxes June and September. And so that's when the village gets the revenues in June and September. And that's all happening in the eight month budget. So our property taxes, we're getting all the property taxes in the eight month budget. And then we're getting all the property taxes again in the 12 month budget. So that extra time that we received it in the eight month budget, we've get, that gives us a little extra cash to offset some of our one time so we don't need to take it from the long range planning fund. So this shows that in a little bit different way where you can see for the general fund of the eight month, the recurring revenues of about 26 million and the recurring expenses of about 24 million. So that's helping to offset those one-time costs. You can see in the 12 month, it's a lot closer in terms of the revenues and the expenses. But at the same time, we are still having our recurring revenues a little bit higher than our recurring expenses, which is exactly what we want to see. This chart shows the comparison over the last couple of years just for the recurring costs. If we were try doing, trying to include all the capital pieces, it would be jumping up and down and very difficult to get a read on because those expenditures just are based on what projects we're doing at what time. But you can see here from, the, from each year, there's a slight increase as the revenues and expenses both go up. In this slide, we didn't bother looking at the eight month because what we're really comparing it to is an annual basis of that 12 month. And so we've got a little bit of inflation both to get for the eight month and then also up to the 12 month. So it's a little bit of an increase over the 24 budgets, <coughs> which is as expected. Now, the only thing I wanted to point out in the graph here is that um, you're a service center or oriented organization. <coughs> so your personnel costs are obviously going to be high. Uh, that's at 46 percent. Now they're going to be a little bit higher based on what I had indicated that you have another fund that the retirement benefits come out of. But your contractuals are at 20 percent, commodities are at about 4 percent. And that's, that's the direction you want to take where if you, know, if you didn't have contractuals at 20 percent, your personnel costs would be higher. You'd have to get that done somehow. But to continue to contract, though, you want to see the contractual number increase a little bit from year to year. Uh, but uh, basically, um, you know, as far as that percentage goes, that 46% personnel, that would bring that up to about 52 or 53% of the total expenses in that fund are, are personnel, which is where they should be. Your, your service-oriented organization, you got to pay for those, pay for that service. Okay. All right. So the next section is going to be covering some of the revenue highlights. But before we get there, any questions on the broad financial overview? Trustee Barker. Yes, thank you. Um, Nick, I'm interested in your opinion on a couple of things. With the additional revenue that we've held on to and not had to spend, um, I heard you say that we have five debts that we're servicing. Is that, did I hear that right? Five bonds, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah five bonds, okay. So is there any thought or is there any advantage to paying the down some of that sooner? I think uh, when the new director starts, one of the things that we're trying to put together is a, a schedule of uh, plans that we'd like to cover, and that's certainly one issue. So what we'd like them to do is to finish your capital plans, which will take a little bit of work, and then kind of overarching from that will be a long-term debt plan. And you always look at, should we pay these things off? Should we increase more debt? What should we do? Because a lot of it is, you know, sometimes you could pay that off and some of those bonds are at a very low rate, like the 22s are probably less than 3%, I would guess, you know, and they're, you know, almost three times that now. Uh, so, but, but I think you got to look at that overall based on what your capital needs are and what your um, future debt plan is going to be. So you'll have a debt plan coming to you probably and within I, about you a year know, I understand that, I understand that and say we're going to always have debt, right? If we've got five things hanging out, you pay them off, and then you're going to have to go out and, Maybe get more debt to do something else. You know, we're talking about some major capital stuff. Maybe um, uh, we'd clear up five, and we or 
two of the five, and we'd be down to three. And we, you know, obviously had the ability financially to pick up a couple of more um, bonds. Yeah, I think they'll look at that when they, when they look at their long-term debt plan. But your debt's fairly recent. You refinanced some. That's uh, 2017, 2019, and 2022. So those were the low-interest-paying uh, years on municipal bonds. But I think when they come to you, they'll come with something more comprehensive. And uh, you're going to be issuing, and in the rate study, too, as well, we'll have some debt recommendations in. And that's going to be coming, you know, in the next couple of weeks, probably, uh, to you. But you're right. You have to look at... Should we pay off the 17s and then issue another debt? And all that's part of the conversation when you do a debt plan, right. which is which is real soon. And then, you know, you have, I'll call it semi-fresh eyes, right? You're familiar with us, but you're... Are oh, these eyes fresh? <laughs> They're <laughs> fresh, right? They're very good. You can see me over here, right? Um, what do you think the our financial situation, you know, it's been good. Uh, Finance and staff have done a great job over the years, and we're in a good position. And we've heard that now, year after year. We got through COVID and everything. But what do you think the biggest risk is to our financial stability? Because you have this knowledge from up here. Belly up. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you, you've always got this issue with the car dealers, but you know that's not going to change for ten years, I don't think. And you got a lot of time to to uh, plan for that and that's something I've talked with Joe about in the past that and then you've got those car dealerships in an area that's that's prime proper you know for redevelopment so you get most of your sales tax from those guys they're going to change the uh, sales tax on food soon and you have some good generators here right you know and uh, and that you're going to have to deal with and what we talked about is dollars. Pardon me? That's a million dollars, right? That's what we well, project every year. Yeah. A million dollars, and you got to sell ten more Porsches to make that <laughs> up. You know? Well, outside of that, then there is no. There's nothing that you see that's going to make a major impact. On the only that. issue you got to deal with longer term, I think, is that pension fund, which everybody else does. But in the scheme of things, uh, as far as uh, where you sit compared to other communities. You know, you're, you're about in the 70th percentile. You know, you're at 52 percent. It seems like we focused on the pension fund and done a good job, right? You did. You did very well. Okay. Thank now, you. Your IMRF is way, really high. You did a real good job with that. And to piggyback with Bruce, we refinanced less than a year ago. And yes. what did we save? Three, four hundred thousand dollars. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. Yep. So the opportunities will come up. And some of them say you can't refinance for five years yeah, or something. Yeah. When that window opens, we'll take a serious look at it yeah okay thank you thanks any other financial overview questions if anybody has it in, out in the audience just Spencer raise yeah. me. can you remind me again what all is in the long-range planning yeah so our long-range planning fund is basically like a savings account that holds a bunch of money that we can then use to give to other funds as they need it. So it's it's really the accumulation of all the times that departments have made sure that expenses were held and we came in under budget or the revenues ended up doing better than we had predicted. And so it's kind of all that accumulation of savings over the course of all these years. And then we hold it because we're going to need it for some of these bigger projects in the future. So that's really its purpose is to sit there as, you know, A, a contingency in case anything catastrophic does happen and B be able to use for some of these bigger capital infrastructure things and, and just as a comment the bonds are pledged revenue stream so it's either um, place the eating tax or the water fund we don't use and I think Nick said that or Spencer one of you two said we don't equate any property taxes to it so that's all good and um, Later on, we're going to get more specific. Right now, it's just an overview, so everybody here can see the type of projects that are in the uh, budget for the 20 months. Yep. All right. If there's no other questions, I'll move on to some of the revenue highlights. Um, so this one just shows kind of the breakdown of some of the different revenues within the general fund and where our money comes from. The biggest one, of course, being sales tax, but I think it's useful to kind of see some of the other ones as well. So sales tax is the one that we'll look at first. And you'll notice that lots of these charts have very similar shapes where there was a little bit of a dip during COVID and then it's recovered 
and then the eight month budget is significantly lower than everything else because it's only eight months worth of revenue instead of the 12. You can see we're kind of, we're projecting to keep growing just a little bit. Um, I think in terms of sales tax, we're kind of flattened out from some of the big increases we were seeing, but we're projecting to that at the end of our 12 month budget will be slightly higher than what we've been bringing in so far. What percent? What percent is car dealers versus? Yeah, I, I would say it's a large chunk of it is the car dealers and yeah, maybe seventy percent, something like that. So it's a large piece of it from the car dealers, um, but it's also everything else we have. So grocery stores are a big amount of that, and you'll see that's one of the reasons that COVID didn't hit us quite as much because grocery stores did really well during COVID, mm -hmm. and we've got several great grocery stores here. We also have Micro Center which also computer stuff did really well during COVID as well as everyone was looking to work remotely. So it's from all those different, all those different places, including our restaurants and all of them, they all contribute in towards the sales tax. But car dealers are a big piece of it for sure. Car dealers uh, did well too during the yes. pandemic. Yes, they had a bit of a dip for a month or two and then everybody thought, oh, no, I really can buy a car. And it, yeah, lots of traveling in cars by themselves instead of on public transportation. Did well for our car sales. Um, the next slide shows places for eating, and again, you can see the similar pattern. Um, again, we're back up to levels exceeding well before where we were before COVID, which is a good sign. Um, part of that is also the cost for things has gone up. So as inflation hits, these taxes that where we get a percentage of the sale price, the revenues the village receives goes up both for sales tax and places for eating as prices go up. Spencer, that's 2%? Yes. 2% place eating thing. Spencer, how are we doing on collections on places for eating tax? I know we've had a few kind of problem childs, I guess, but has it gotten better or is it still yeah, a problem? Yeah, we're doing pretty well. I, as always, there's going to be some delinquencies and some people that always forget to pay until you call them and some that only pay once it gets really threatening before they pay. and. So I think right now we've got, of our you know roughly 100 restaurants or so, I think we have three that are more than three months behind. So it's not too bad, and we're working with them. And so it's better than the last time we talked oh, about. Yeah, it. It I think it's better than it was out, before. Well, one might still be over here. Is it? Yeah. 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 I I will say I think the the new system that our finance department under Jamie and then Natasha was a big part of it of setting up this local gov to be able to have restaurants be able to pay the places for eating tax online. It's an easy, the yeah. system, I think, will automatically send reminders and remind them if they've missed it. So for all the people that staff used to have to call because they would never pay until they got a reminder, this system automatically can do some of those pieces for us and can track it a little bit better. And I think it's, I think it's been very helpful for restaurants to have the easy way to file online as opposed to having to mm -hmm. oh, yeah. make the checks and fill all, all the paperwork by hand and turn it in. And I think that's probably been helpful in terms of making, if it's easier for them to do it, they're more likely to do it. Yeah. So I think that's been a, a big success. Out of the three, one will be making payments. The other two were kind of... Still working on? Yeah, working on. Yeah. Yeah. This one shows our video gaming. Again, it's the same kind of shape as everything else. The revenues all kind of trend the same. And we haven't seen a change in that with kind of the hold we've had on new video gaming establishments. Are we concerned about the upward trajectory continuing given that cap that's been Saturation. stated? Yeah, I mean, I, I think what we've seen so far is indicating that things are going well. I think our deputy liquor commissioner said that he thought the last month we had may have been the best month we've ever had. So even as we're not allowing additional ones in the downtown and we're not allowing any more video gaming cafes, it seems like it's still generating a good amount of revenue. There's still plenty of people that are Finding going there. Using the ones we have. Yeah. Using the ones we okay. have. Okay. Yep. To each his own. <laughs> yep. And Spencer, as yeah. far as, since we only have one cannabis, we don't highlight that because it's, right. go, you can explain it. Yeah. So the. We do have one cannabis establishment. The state kind of has a general rule of being careful on their sites not to ex 
not to list how much revenue they, we receive from any group that's less than five. And so they kind of view that as questionable in terms of sharing proprietary information. So with that, we don't have a slide that highlights, here's how much revenue we've got from cannabis sales. And we can't publicly announce it or anything like that because that would be, you know, potentially problematic for them. Only because of the low quantity and you can immediately equate it. When we get two? Or if five, we get two. He said under five. So what the state's really? standard is, is five. Okay. We could talk with the attorney and see kind of what levels we are with that. What we can do is say our projections were pretty good. Our projections were that they'd be bringing in roughly half a million a year, and our projections are looking pretty good. <laughs> so we can do rough statements, and hopefully that's okay, and we won't get sued. Um, the next one shows income tax, and again, it's that similar trajectory where it's still been increasing. This one had less of a dip. During COVID, it was still kind of was progressing up and it's still trending up again. And these are largely based on the estimates that we get from the Illinois Municipal League. This one shows the hotel motel revenue and you can see that they were by far the hardest hit during the COVID situation where they went down and they were down for a little while, but they've now recovered and you can see our actuals are higher than the actuals were before COVID. So again, they've, they've picked up. Um, we are still conservatively estimating our budget to be a little bit less than projected, but we're still moving it up a little bit. And this is the one where for a little while there was, especially during the COVID years, there was some concern about the balances and, you know, we weren't bringing in enough to cover our outgoing expenses. But at this point, we're getting a lot closer and our balances are so high that if we spend them down a little bit, that's not a bad thing. So our hotel, motel revenues and fund are doing pretty well. This one shows interest. As you're aware, our interest rates are pretty high mm -hmm. and we're on track to hit probably close to $3.5 million worth of interest this year. The red line shows what we use for our operating budget. So when we talked about those recurring revenues, that's the line we're using to say, here's how much we're planning to spend on recurring things from this interest. Because it wouldn't make sense to say, oh, we've got an extra $800,000 worth of interest coming in. We should hire some people because then you run into, well, what happens when that interest rates drop? And what do you do with all these services that you've now started your residents expecting to receive higher levels of service? And so we've been careful to say, this extra interest revenue that we expect to get, we're just going to be using on things like capital or other one-time expenditures, not making a commitment relying on, on that. And that's kind of what that red line shows. Reoccurring, on the reoccurring costs. Yes, on the recurring costs. So that red line is how much mm -hmm. we're using for recurring costs. I only wanted to mention that if you, if you do bring those fund balances down to that 50% level that we talked about, and those operating funds, you're still going to be making over a million dollars a year just on interest itself. All right, so any questions on any revenues before we get on to highlights of expenses? Hotel, motel? Um, yeah. Come up, oh, sorry. Come up yeah, to you the come podium. Up to the, oh, sorry. Uh, no, uh, hotel, motel, but it's largely been flat for the last 10 years. Um, the revenue's coming in? Yeah. I mean, yep. that smells like a hotel, motel event that's languishing. It's languishing. Is that fair? I mean, I, I Do you think, think that's fair or no? I think I mean, it's been no, increasing a little bit. Um, I think in terms of, you know, during COVID, I think they definitely had some significant issues there. Mm -hmm. I think they've largely recovered, and I think they're kind of going up. Again, we're projecting, conservatively projecting to be a little bit less than what we had in 2023. But I think they're doing good work. I think they've been spending a lot on renovations and working to try to make that be able to go a little bit higher into the future. I think. And I wonder so. how much of an impact a lot of the natatorium events yeah, have so, had yeah, as well. I was just going to say, when exactly did that open? That was what, 21? That's what I was trying to remember. So it just opened yeah. at a weird time in terms of the COVID numbers for us to really see. Yeah, so it's probably helping with that recovery from COVID, I'm sure. Yeah, that's a good point. We based, we've got... <coughs> four hotels, three on Pasconelli, and of course the Hilton. So yep. the Hilton's probably a majority of this. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. I would say the tax. majority for sure. 
Any other revenue questions? All right, now we get on to what all is included in the budget. And so for all that, um, $84 million worth what kind of things are included in there. And it's a little bit tricky because in most of these cases, we're talking about 20-month budgets. And so if you're thinking about what did we have in here and what did we have in the past years, a lot of these will be different than that. And so it gets a little tricky on some of them. We'll kind of talk through, through some of those as we come to them. So the biggest thing that our money goes towards is, as Nick talked about, our, our services. And so the services that our residents can get all the time, you know, having police available to help, having fire responding to emergencies, having public works clearing the roads during the snowstorms, making sure we've got good roads, having community development, making sure that building things go th smoothly and that we're putting the uses where they need to be. All these services we do on a regular basis that's the vast majority of what we have, especially in our general fund. And that's what a lot of these cover. I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail on those services because what I'm really gonna cover are especially the new things we're doing and some of the one-time expenditures, especially. So, and this is the part where we are gonna talk a little bit about our priorities. So at the bottom of these slides, you'll see references to the priorities from the, from the strategic plan. So governance about kind of thinking through our plans, making sure that our, we can provide the good services to our residents, making sure we've got good plans to do that and the employees have the tools they need to do that. And so this slide talks about some of our plans for our future. So we have in the budget $150,000 for a comprehensive plan. The comprehensive plan are, is more of the community development related, the use related view of the village. We also have $50,000 in there for a strategic plan, which is a broader, more generic plan about what direction do we want the village to go in general, not just specifically to land use. We also have money for a branding and marketing plan, and then some money to start looking through some of our future potential issues and options with regards to the fire department. So I know we've talked about that in the past, about you know wondering how long this part-time system will work and making sure we're prepared if it gets to a point where it can't. Question. Yes. Okay, under that fire department future planning, not only are we looking at fire department personnel, but we're looking at the possibilities of a future upgrade to the fire station or a new facility. What exactly is included in that future planning? So that amount for specifically for future mm -hmm. planning is looking about the general future of the department and what does that look like and what okay. are some of the options. Okay. That's kind of the very first step to being able to say, once we know what those different paths are, then we can start saying, what does that mean for the facility? Okay. What does that mean for everything else related to fire? And there's a lot of things that I think in relation to the fire department, especially like the facility is one example, that are sort of stuck because we're saying, boy, there's a lot of unknowns. And so one of our goals is to try to make there be fewer unknowns and at least have some possibilities. So instead of saying, yeah, this would be good to do, but we're not really sure what will happen. Maybe we should, maybe we shouldn't. And just kind of being stuck, we want to have something to be able to say, okay, here's three different options. Here's how this choice would be impacted any of these three different ways. Now we can make some decisions. Do we have an idea when we're going to have this in place where we can start looking at it? Are we when we're going to probably have to get a company to do this, I'm assuming, and then yes. do we know exactly what our timeline is so we've got something concrete that we can look at when we decide what road we need to travel? I don't think we have any concrete timeline right now. Right now we're just kind of saying, are we okay with including money in the budget to be able to do it? Okay. Once we, you know, once that's done, then we can start saying, okay, now how exactly are we going to go about doing it? What's the timeline? Those kind of things. Okay. But what this doesn't do we're still communicating to other communities as mm -hmm. far as a, a, a opportunity to combine so but this will tell us the best way or different options yeah so, so money to be able to look okay. towards that yeah can you go into more detail on the branding marketing plan so r I will say right now we don't have a lot of detail in that it's just setting aside some money to do that in general what they do is they will kind of take a look at and I, I think we would want to do it after we've done our strategic plan and have a little bit of a view of what do we want to become as a village but in general what they will do is they'll kind of do similar to the comprehensive plan where we're getting a lot of input you know from various stakeholders and kind of saying what do we want to be known as 
what do we want to have our, how do we get our message out, all those different pieces, but largely what message do we want to be sending out to the community and how do we do that in a good comprehensive and cohesive way. So it's getting some professional input into that and that's something that came up as a suggestion in the strategic plan um, and from a committee group we've had for a while several years plan. ago the last strategic plan we were said we that. really should look into that and so it's been on our radar at this point it's so close to the time to do another strategic plan it makes more sense to get the strategic plan done first to say what direction do we want to go because that's a key piece of what do we want people to think of when they think of Westmont and those things so it just seemed we'll confusing see. like the strategic plan you know was fifty thousand dollars and then the branding and marketing was 125 so the prices are very different and like in my head the strategic plan is like the bigger <laughs> plan so i was just like confused in terms of like why that was so much more for what is really kind of a, an add-on to the strategic plan Yes. So I will say when we got the quotes um, a while ago. Marketing people are just more expensive. <laughs> it seems to be, or they were telling us to plan on more money. Okay. Um, and I will say the marketing one is one where we have never had that specific service. We have just kind of talked to people in general about what should we be looking at as we're looking to do this sort of a thing. So it has not been bid out. We haven't gotten competitive quotes. My hope is, and expectation is it will end up coming in hopefully significantly less than that. Okay. But that's kind of what we've been told is what you should be thinking about for the going rate. For the strategic plan, we have had that service. It was a few years ago. But we <coughs> are able to say, what did we pay for that? <coughs> Add some inflationary amounts to it. And if it ends up that strategic plan costs more and the other one costs less, they're budgeted in the same area and they'll be able to be a little bit of give and take. And I'd imagine the strategic plan is probably more of an update than a starting from fresh type of thing. Or we've yeah, never I, done this branding and marketing before, at least I can remember. Yeah. I don't think we've never yeah, spent money on that. Yeah, there has not been a base for that. All of these all of these things are, you know, beginning of work or what a, in addition to what we've done in the past, but it's you know, it's two to three years out and this is an allocation, a placeholder, right? Right. Yep. It can be adjusted. Yes. How old are our current strategic and comprehensive plans? I will defer to Joe on how old our comprehensive plan is. 2013. Yeah, I'll say. Okay. Same thing with the... Yeah, our, I think our strategic plan is, is close to that. I think it's about five or six mm -hmm. years old. Yeah. I do remember we had that, and one of the things that came out of the strategic plan was the branding. Mm -hmm. I know this was like maybe two years before the 100th anniversary, and because we, branding's, you know, just not, I mean, it's, you know the logo we have and we had a different one for the 100th anniversary and we were hoping to come out of that you know with new branding so um, you know not to return to something else you know to maybe change it later so that's just kind of how long we've been talking about it is it is the it the best month thing came out of that you know the you know just a branding. question I have on that though Steve is like if the budgets approved as is I know, like in the past, you know, I guess what I'm asking is, or is the plan to, if we do go out to bid for this branding and marketing plan, are we going to like see what those bids come in first? I just said, hey, I just never seen this before in any community. So I'm just curious what the heck it even involves. Like, what, sure. what are we getting for that? So I personally would like to see it before we approve kind of a sure. thing. Anything in the yep. budget, anything we spend, you'll be involved in that process. This is more of a making sure there's money in there so that we can do something. It, whether it's this or capital improvement projects or other things, they're not designed yet. They're just, but if there's no money in there, then you can't even mm -hmm. begin. And that's fine. I guess I was just, yeah, I, I was we, just concerned that it would come to a board meeting to approve it or something. It's like, well, what the heck is it even? Yeah, we, we, we would definitely off. have. <laughs> yeah, we'll have. The other communities that have, have done something like oh. this? Is that, is listen that to the radio. Listen to radio now. Bolingbrook is advertising on every radio uh, station. Bolingbrook Yep. Come to Bolingbrook. Yeah, I hear. I hear that. I mean, I just and that's you probably call WGN and do that yeah. though. Like, do you need a plan to figure that out? I don't well, know. Well, I think that's questioning. part of their branding marketing plan. They probably set aside X amount of dollars, and a committee decides. Out of that. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. But I will say yes. Before we're spending anything like. $125,000 to do a branding and marketing plan or 50000 for a strategic plan, we'll make sure we're coming back to the board and talking about it and talking about 
where we are in the process with getting out any of the requests for proposals or requests for qualifications and make sure you guys are included on that at our committee meetings. And I, I do think some of these may be a little bit further along in the budget process, maybe more in the 12 month before we're actually spending any of that money. But we'll make sure you guys are all included in it before we start just doing it, for sure. And I should have went into branding and marketing instead of building. <laughs> <laughs> maybe so. And it's, this could be a very high estimate, and that's my hope. My hope is it comes in less than that. So in addition to planning for the future, because we're a service and we provide lots of these services, and as Nick talked about, a big chunk of our budget is personnel. It's very important that we make sure we're recruiting and retaining good personnel. As you know, we had the compensation study that we did not too long ago. That was a key part of that. And so we've got information in here about some of those other pieces of expenditures that tie in with that. So we've got money set aside in the eight-month budget for a general wage adjustment. And some employees are doing 2%, some are doing 3%. Um, the collective bargaining agreement for police is 3%. And the village board very generously agreed when we did the compensation study increases in January, agreed that to make sure all employees were able to receive something, that we were able to take 1% of what employees would have received for their general wage adjustment in May and were able to do it in January. So in essence, a large number of village employees got 1% a few months earlier, and that was a good way to make sure the compensation study was well received, I think. I think that was wise of the board to do it that way. Um, but now that means some of the village are getting the 2%. I will say the police were offered that same opportunity. They chose to just stick with what was in the contract. That was their preference. And so that's fine. That's why they're receiving the 3% as opposed to the 2%. In the 12-month budget, we've got general wage adjustment. And then as the board's aware, part of the compensation discussion also included the idea that we needed to set aside some money for merit. And so the police collective bargaining agreement calls for 3% general wage adjustment for May, so that's the 3%. And then we're looking at a grand total between general wage adjustment and merit of a grand total of 6%. As you know, we're working on the merit program, and so exactly how that 6% will be used in terms of what the smallest amount employees will get versus the highest amount, that's still in process. As you know, we're working to get that done by January, so that will be in effect in January, and so we're starting we're assuming that for the 12 month budget, which starts in January. We also have some money listed here for a paramedic contract increase, as we've talked about in the past. Keeping our paramedic contract pay competitive is important, so we're able to con continue to get medics in our contract. And I will say that $176,000 increase is a little weird. It's one of those things that's odd because we have this 20 month budget. And so in the next 12 months, the contract has only gone up about $76,000 from where the contract is now. But over the course of the 20 months, if we compare the contractual rates during that 20 months to what it is today, that's the $176,000. In addition, we've got $140,000 continuing in our education incentives. That's not a change. That's just continuing what we have had in the past years. That includes both getting firefighters to paramedics school and then also our village-wide education incentives. And it also includes a fire service stipend that those were a few priorities that the board had last year in terms of things we can do to help strengthen our fire system. Any questions on that? If not, we'll move on. So another piece of the governance in our strategic plan is making sure that we've got the facilities and the equipment needed to provide these services for our residents. And so these are some of the highlights of expenses that we have in our various facilities. And one of the big ones we're doing is building the salt dome. That's the large one. Uh, we've got the increases or the costs for improvements in the police facility and the fire facility. I will say just before this meeting, Chief Gunther let me know he's already found ways to trim that police facility cost a little bit to make it a little bit less over the 20 months. But that's what we've got on the budget, so it was too late to change the numbers. Good effort, though. Yes, and we appreciate it. And that extra money that we save, that'll just be money that goes into our long-range planning fund and we'll use for other projects in the future. So thank you. 
We also have listed here our vehicles. So you'll notice that we're getting quite a few public works vehicles and patrol cars. You may recall we typically do about three patrol cars a year, but because we've got this 20 month budget, we're kind of doing two years at once. And so we've got those six. So this lists those expenses for vehicles for this year, for, for this budget. Spencer, those are ordered vehicles, not vehicles in hand, right? Are there, is there any trouble with getting these? There's definitely trouble with getting vehicles and it will take a while. This is what we expect to spend. I think some of them may have already been ordered and some of them are ones that we're going to order and hopefully get. Right. We've got everything we've ordered. And fire is even so more yeah. aggravated. I'm over that. here. I mean, and I think that's important to, to be hear said, what you right? said. Yeah. yeah. It seems like a lot of my, I'm asking that for Harold Berry, former. <laughs> <laughs> Good evening. Um, yeah, last summer we ordered um, some particularly large dump trucks. We ordered last summer for 2024 and 2025, which we hope we might get in 2026. So we're aggressively looking at other options, see where we can get other vehicles. If someone has, you know, uh, an order that fell through or another way we can get them. So it is getting to be kind of difficult and expensive. So fire was the same way. I don't know if we remember you allowed us to order vehicles that are that they don't start building them for three years. So and we've said it. We've got a fund set aside to cover this. Yep. And these are just orders, so you don't pay for it until you take receipt. But, yeah. Yep. This next slide shows some of these other tools and other kind of equipment and software that we're getting. Uh, so we've got some server and phone replacement needs. We've got $133,000 set aside for trying to get both parking and permitting a little bit more online and more up to date with kind of the current current times. Um, so we've got a few different softwares we're looking at for parking, both for parking ticketing and parking permitting, and <coughs> also permitting. We've got some money set aside for permitting, like in community development and those kind of things to try to make some of this online permitting a little bit easier. And we've got some money to provide some equipment to our fleet division so they're able to work on our vehicles. We've got some money set aside for workstations and conference rooms, and then some equipment for fire. This one shows a list of things related to trees and grounds. So we've got our annual tree planting of about $230,000. That's an increase of about $48,000. And this one is focusing specifically on kind of the annual amount um, and as well as that increase. You've got the landscape irrigation for that beautiful W flower bed that you can see out that window. Um, and then a few other places as well. I will also note on the bottom it's a small dollar amount, but it's an important one so we want to make sure we included it. And this is a, a grant program that we are implementing and about to announce. And basically, as you'll recall, a few months ago as part of the Heritage Tree Ordinance rewrite, there were some things about costs that if people are chopping down trees on the public right-of-way, so the trees that are on the parkway, they have to pay a fee, and then what we're doing is taking that money and putting it into a program to be able to provide other residents with the ability to get a grant to plant trees on their own private property. So it's a small dollar amount, but it, it's a nice one, a nice benefit for our residents to be able to plant those trees. Okay. You know, I did want to comment on this. Yeah. Um, we had at the last Environmental Improvement Committee meeting, we had a presentation by uh, our village forester and I asked the question you know we're talking about trees and tree opportunities we had you know the emerald ash borer and that devastation and we caught up and they've been doing a great job with planting and pruning and you can see it around town and we appreciate that there is still a thousand public um, opportunities on village property parkway or other um, that could be planted so the, you know I, I'm just saying that because the program needs to stay healthy and funded so that you know obviously a tree line street or 
Cass Avenue South when that grows up and that's a tree lined roadway it's gonna be beautiful so it's well worth it to me and I'd like to see, I'm happy to see the money is there right and out of all these that's a reoccurring yes been, that the other ones are one-time expense yes. so every year yep. we're gonna have a continue yeah. thank you yeah This slide shows some of the expenses for our downtown. So the biggest one is the $3 million for moving the S-curve at Burlington and the ComEd relocation that's required there to kind of get that property ready for development. We have another $2.5 million for the Quincy streetscape. As the board talked about, we wanted to make sure we give people on Quincy a little bit of a break. So that cost is in the 12-month budget is when we're planning to do that construction, not in the 8-month. We have $390,000 set aside in this 20 months for our downtown incentive program. And that is about 190,000 in our eight month budget. That includes about 40,000 that we're carrying over. So projects that the board has already approved, but that hasn't actually been completed yet. So we've got a budget for that in the next year as well. On top of that 40,000, we are budgeting 150,000 for that year and then 200,000 for the year after that and so right now we're just setting aside that money in general for the plan the next step in that part of it will be for the board to make some decisions about what tier they want to fund as you recall there's three different tiers in the program and right this current year we funded a hundred thousand dollars all in the first tier and so that'll be a conversation the board will have in the future about what funding level we want to do for what tiers and so right now we're just setting aside the money for that um, there's also some money set aside for some fall and winter decorations and displays in the downtown and work in the depot space. We also have money set aside for the downtown streetscape plan. So the idea, similar to what we've done for the streetscape in Quincy, but right now this is the planning stage to try to figure out what do we want to do with our downtown? What do we want our downtown to look like? Kind of not including the businesses, but more of on all the public property that we've got there. What do we want that to be like? And We've got $55,000 set aside for a couple of pocket parks in the downtown. Nice. And I think we've had a discussion at Public Works Committee about some of those and what those would be like. So we've got money set aside in the budget for that. Come sure, come on up. Back. I have questions. So. Go ahead. Uh, right. I just want to ask for the uh, downtown streetscape planning, um, is that going to be open to public comment and things like that? How, how does that process work? Yeah, there's usually a piece where we do invite the public to come. I know we did for the planning for the West Quincy streetscape. We had that maybe a few months ago, I think. So yeah, there would, there would definitely be opportunity for public involvement. Okay, you know what? Thank you. I should have been asking names. Go ahead and say your name. Sure, Alex Kubaki. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. I'd like to. I, can I go? Okay, so I guess I have a couple questions. Um, first would be with the S-curve and the ComEd relocation. I mean, is that something that we are if the property ends up being developed that we will hopefully recoup some of that cost is that an investment we're making in in that i mean hopefully okay so it, it is an investment it's part of that tiff so the central business district tiff where the village has already loaned you know a few million dollars to the tiff this would basically be the village loaning another three million dollars to the tiff to do this work and if the property is developed, then the TIF increment may generate enough to pay it back to us, depending on if we have to be giving some of that TIF increment to the development to make it happen, or if we're able to recoup it, and depending on how long the TIF extends. So I think it will be dicey as to whether or not we'll be fully paid back before the TIF ends in about 12 years or so. Um, if the TIF is extended, like we've talked about possibly doing then I think there's a lot better chance the village would be paid back before the TIF ends. But I think as we're doing this, we have to recognize that there's also the possibility that the benefit might be that we get the property developed and we don't fully reimburse ourselves for the $3 million with that TIF increment. Hopefully we will. But there's also the chance we don't, the property doesn't get developed and we've- That's possible as well. Not. Um, my second question was, what's the deal with these fall and winter decor displays? Is there more information about that situation? Sure. Because I mean, we have Reese, you want to talk some to things I see up from time to time. So are they broken or what are we doing? Yeah, um, some of them are starting to look pretty tired. Um, the lights are starting to go out on them. Um, it's 
hard to repair them and keep keep them up and running. And we also are looking to um, bring in some more additional decorations now that Addington Plaza and the streetscape area is up and running um, to get that area um, festive for the holidays. And their the displays are like big lighted. Very expensive. Items, yeah. Yeah, I mean, usually there's quite a few big mm -hmm. lit ones along along the mm -hmm. tracks, and so those are just aging out, is yep. what you're saying. a lot okay. of them are, yes. Okay. Hey, Amy, just a quick question on that. Have you looked ever into, like, using one of those firms that just comes in, sets it up, and stores them all the winter when, so that we don't have to own any of it or manage it? Um, I'm just curious if that's better. No, we haven't, but that's a good idea, and we can look into it. I don't know if it's more money. I've never looked at it, but yeah, um, maybe you know, it will help. I, I don't know anybody that does that, but I can look into it for sure. Um, and see what our options would be in that you know, We always area. get like emails on our village email from companies. But that house on North Wilmet does it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, hey, I, I love it. It just. And, and my other question on this, is this come from convention and tourism, these bonds, 170K? Yes. So but, all of these for beautifying the downtown does come from convention too. tourism. So all of that 170000 money does come from that. her convention tourism fund. Okay. Trust That's Park. a good point. Barker. Um, just uh, t two comments. The one would I'd, I'd be interested to know if the dip program, the 390, you know, we just rolled that out. People were taking advantage of it. Um, our resident expert on the dip program is making his way to the podium. But anyway, so it's to me the 390 is a placeholder, and if people are using it, I, I, and we could go back and add it, right? But should we or could we i know we can but should we plan for more money in that dip program mm. just to have it there um for people to take advantage of it you know it's one thing to say we have a program and then it's always to talk about well you can have that funding if you do something if we don't run out can't we always adjust that too if we find a project we can change the i'm going to say yes because when we introduce this i think um that Spencer had indicated that that could be done, right? Since he's in charge of uh, the finances. Well, I, is there? I my question is: Is there any harm in making that number bigger, right? That's really that harm, except that when we get to the end, you'll find a finely balanced budget. So okay. any this number we can works increase now. anything, right. but at the expense of something else or. And then we feel and then it's a good number. I, for the downtown improvement projects, I will say that's another example of where, in theory, it's coming out of the TIF, and maybe the TIF will generate increment to pay it back, but it's also part of that same pot of money that we're going to be spending that $3 million out of that has the negative balance. So we could add more to it. It's just more money the village is loaning to that fund. Yes. Okay. And then I would like to just, if I could, I got just a, by way of background on the three million dollars for the S curve and the com, comet relocation is the S curve and the comet intersecting that property there is a, is an issue uh, because they're strange you know they're not rectangular or square shape so development looks at it and goes I'm not even going to ask about that because I've got issues there so until it gets cleaned up you know that's like if you have a dilapidated building if you tear it down and put grass there all of a sudden people are more interested in it so that's the, you know, it's a big number, but it's, you know, it's kind of something. Two that thirds I, of it is utility related. Yeah. Right, right. And then if ComEd has to be moved, you know, five years from now, it's just going to cost more. Yeah. So. Yeah, I remember when it was 800000 <laughs> Yeah. In three years, it gone up. I put that in an email just a month ago. It's, uh, Trustee Barker, I just wanted to add a comment on the DIP program. I think staff has done a good job the message because your comment was spot on about like the life safety grants was always use it until it's gone i think and maybe steve correct me if i'm wrong but i thought the message was of the public is show us your projects and if there's something you know we have the ability to, to get more funding so i think that's a different message this time which hopefully alleviates what you've brought up and uh tying your points together the whereas we're talking about a 20-month budget you'll do appropriations Eight months first 12 months later so we've there's room to fine-tune eight months from now trust you little I had a quick question about the fall and winter decor does that include any repairs or additions to the lighting on the trees downtown yes that's I believe that's what that's a chunk of what it is yeah 
Thank you. Yep, they're aging too. Well, oh. it's important to have them for it the, is. Yeah. Yeah. For the um, summer. Just some good. I'll, um, with the downtown improvement program, again, I want to say that's what Main Street had in mind when that program was probably rolled out in 1996, 1997. So I'm really, really glad that we're continuing it. It's been revamped, and I'm hoping and I am very excited that people are actually looking at it and taking advantage of those funds because that's, that's what it's in place for. Okay. Safety. All right, so we've got a few items tying into the priority of safety. And so the first one I'll mention is we've got money set aside for an additional fire shift. As we talked about, there's lots of unknowns and moving pieces with fire. And so we're doing for this what we have did kind of in some prior budgets where we're saying we're setting aside the money, but we may not implement it immediately. We're going to wait till some of these other moving pieces sort of settle in. So we've got the money in the budget because we don't want to wait another 20 months to do it but the manager will kind of be making the call as to when is it time to start moving forward with that. And the chief explained We've got, what that... Oh, what yeah, and how it will be beneficial and what that extra shift would be covering. Sure. Yeah. Thanks, chief. Mm. He was jumping out of his chair. <laughs> I was just Scratching. confused, but... So, basically, I think I've told you at last fire public safety meeting that, you know, we're just under 5,100 calls a year. Um, I think last week I was not here at board, but our call volume is up right now for the year at 11.9%. Mm. Uh, we were on track for 6,000 calls. So as I've explained before, this person would be the fourth person on our ladder truck. What my plan is to make sure that we have this third ambulance in service 24-7, 365. So just this week alone, and through the year already in four months, our ambulance has gone out 48 times. Just on Monday alone, that ambulance, extra ambulance went out four times, which means your ladder truck, the most expensive piece of equipment that we have, is unmanned for about six and a half hours. Because those people that are on that ladder truck jump onto that third ambulance and that truck's out of service. And then what if we need it? Who, what happens? We have we to call, call one from another, another town. town. And as the mayor and manager kind of said, Clarendon Hills has taken their ladder truck, which I fully expect to be in my downtown if we have an issue is now being manned in Hinsdale because they're sharing resources. So I don't even have a ladder truck coming from Clarendon Hills anymore. So I feel personally that I need this now. Okay. I understand what the village manager is saying, but this has nothing really to do with <coughs> what the future of the fire department holds. This is our call volume today that we want to and are continuing to be busy and I feel that this ambulance is up and, not, up and running that I feel that the, the, the call volume that it has for it, the insurance and Medicare and GEMT money will pay for itself. Now, not always, and Mr. Parker and I disagree a little bit with that, Clearly. but um, yeah. it's, it's still a very vital in piece if we want to have that truck up and running. And, you know, I, I've told the manager and told Chief Gunther that we know the ambulances have to go down for maintenance four times a year. Mm -hmm. So it's 24 days that three ambulances are down. And obviously, if it breaks, it could be down more. And we certainly cannot schedule those people if that ambulances are down. Like right now, one of our ambulances is back in Sterling getting warranty work done. And it's taken up a lot of time to get that done. So currently now today, we're running with only two ambulances. So obviously, during the stretch, we wouldn't schedule this extra person because that third ambulance isn't here. So. So this 250 is the cost of having someone or multiple people because they're part time 24 seven throughout the whole year. Correct. Yes, sir. And I, and I will you. know that is the annual cost not broken up to the 20 months. So and that doesn't exclude any ambulance fees or anything like that. That's just the raw cost. To us. Yeah, be, because, you know, as the chief mentioned, we've got the people going on the ambulances now. And so we may generate a few extra ambulance calls. It won't be very many in terms of new ambulance calls. The main thing is to be able to have the ladder truck, right. the tower truck available. We're not right? getting any new money from it. Yeah, it's not, not, it's not very much new money. Calls. Yeah, I mean, if, if the truck is out and therefore we couldn't have people jump off the truck and onto the ambulance, there'll be a few of those potential calls. So we may generate a little bit of money on it, but largely it's, yeah, that's the cost annually to do it. So it's not offset by any of those reductions. I will also say, a piece of it will potentially be offset because it'll be one of the costs of the department and then 
there's a complicated process that has gone through every year where we say what's the cost of the department yeah. divided by the number of calls we go on and apply a portion of that to ambulance calls and then that is a piece that's factored into the calculation of how much ambulance calls are so there'll be a little bit of a decrease on that I don't think it'll be anywhere near the 250,000 but there'll be a slight increase in revenue that's not listed here does just to be conservative so if we so. keep this off does that affect our ISO rating at all no, no. Not, nothing changes with our ISO rating, nothing uh, uh, changes with accreditation. It's just that we, Westmont, are serving our residents versus another community coming in and taking that third call from us. So right service. before this board meeting, we had double full arrests at 6501. Uh -huh. If we would have dropped another call, Clarendon Hills, Oak Brook, Tri-State, Donners Grove, somebody's coming to take that, and they get that call, they get that revenue. I mean, it, more than so, the revenue, so, isn't that a concern for the citizens I, that we it's taking longer for takes somebody longer. else to get Response here than our time. own? That's what I was, yeah. I think you're spot yeah, on. I mean, there, at guys. the same time, I think that's pretty common, right? We respond all the time to other communities. Other we, communities all the time respond to us. We do the same that's thing. just the mutual aid, right? Yeah, that's we just do the auto aids. Yep. Go ahead. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's tough, though. I mean, I, I'm. Good. I'm concerned because our citizens, the average age of the citizenry here is increasing exponentially and if we're worrying about the people that are here i'm concerned about the response time i'm more worried about the call volume that continues to increase when i started here in 1997 we were running about 2200 calls now we're at 5100 i'm guessing you'll see me here next year saying that we're at 55 5600 again for a part-time agency is just crazy and we haven't even opened the new medical facility in Ag yeah right correct mm -hmm. or the Mm -hmm. other one than 6400 South Cass and that everything that's going on so again if, if I didn't feel it was necessary you folks know that I'm all about conserving and saving money but I think this is a necessity 3453 MS calls in 2023 and we are 11.9 percent ahead of today where we were last year is very concerning to me as your chief and with these being part-time staff couldn't we in theory I know you don't like to do this but in theory if there's no extra let's say calls hopefully go down you could pull back from this role because they are just part-time staff absolutely so I mean, what's I the could, risk i could give you a six month you know give it for six months and try it and give you a report in june and then give you another report I, I mean, and if the call volume starts to decrease then we certainly could here, just I mean, pull it off by the time we have those two new facilities up and running what are the chances anything's going down very little let's, be, let's right. be serious right i, I know it's I, only going to go up uh, Trustee Guzzo, I wonder what you're going to think about this. <laughs> <laughs> All right. She's chomping at the bit, man. So I'm going to jump out of my seat. We know the call volume's not going to go down. Yeah. I mean, that's a given. I remember 40 years ago with the call volume, what it was being, as you all know, my father was Frank Johannick, and I really am not in favor of keeping this on hold. I think we need to give them what they need. I think our residents need that. I think our fire department personnel need that because we also have to remember too, we've got the railroad tracks. I mean, not that that's gonna affect a lot of things, but I wanna make sure that we are in a place where we can give our residents the service that they've known for over how many years? A hundred years. Yeah. And, and I am personally not in favor in keeping this on hold. I but think they need the staffing. Trustee Barker. No, he had his- Well, I mean, it's first. in the budget. Yeah. It's proposed yeah. in the We're budget, and this budget, budget starts I, in a week. I don't want it on hold, though. I want us starts to in a week. I, well, and that's okay. fine, but it's Why right here. It it's saying on it's hold. on hold. It makes us feel like it's not starting in a week. Yeah, right. So I, I agree with that's Marie. The part, I, that's the part where I'm unclear. All right. I agree with Marie and Linda. The response time is a factor, but Chief, the the added personnel will that help alleviate some of the shortages that you've experienced over the last year as well. It, well, it would make it worse, right? I, I agree. It's shots. probably going to hurt it, but yeah. um, you know, right now I have five members that are in paramedic school. Some of them have already passed and waiting to take the national exam. I currently have three brand new people in medic school, but we're also looking to hire six because we were at 80 and now we're at 66 again. So truly, and, and the manager knows, I will not be able to fill 24/7, 365 to start May 1 or June 1. Yeah. It's gonna be, I'll fill it where I can. Obviously, you know, funds become available. We need more people, but more people, you, you know it is, it's just spinning the wheels. It's, it's yeah, kicking we, the can and I need those people. But 
Right now, my other deputies on vacation, my new deputy sitting right here that uh, will be sworn in on June 13th. But, um, you know, we, we need to get staffing. We need to get that staffing back up to 80 to make that feasible to get that ambulance out at all times. So and, and it's not going to happen every day. As I know, when those ambulances are down, that's 24 times. We always have ambulances that have to go to the dealer for a week. So, you know, I would say we'll probably fill it. 250 times out of 365, you know, that's my optimal guess, but I'm not positive. So I could tell from your body language, body language here <laughs> that this is, you know, it's becoming a very serious issue. And, you know, I, I, we had heard, just heard from fire department, you know, there, there is no magic bullet to solve this, but, you know, I think we need to start thinking real serious about before it is a problem, Yeah. you know, that, just falls on us, right? And I've talked to the local chiefs, I've talked to the Downers Grove chief and the Tri-State chief, and they currently run three ambulances today, and they're looking at going to four hmm. because their call volume continues to increase. Wow. So as ours continues to increase, and again, hopefully decrease, but I don't expect that to happen, you know. How again, many? if we don't care, I don't want to say don't care about serving our citizens, I want my people serving our citizens. I don't want a Tri-State or a Clearing Hills ambulance in our town serving our citizens when I think we do a stand-up job. And, you know, I want them up in Bays Lake taking care of our people. Trusty Lou. How many um, nursing homes, rehab centers, retirement centers do we have in Westmont? So we currently have three nursing homes. Mm -hmm. We have Aspired Living, which is an assisted living facility. We have 865 North Cass, which is Cordy as an assisted living. And then we have everything up in Mays Lake. So as you remember in the year-end report, we went to Mays Lake last year 412 times, hmm. and that's only gonna increase. So, um, and that doesn't include what's going on, folks, right now with mental health. You know, in the year-end report, you talk about 303 West Ogden at that medical facility. We are up at 750 Oakmont every single day, sometimes two, three, four times a day for the mental health issues. The chief and the mayor and the manager are well aware of what's going on in DuPage County and putting that new mental health building a part of it. Uh, I was just part of the Good Sam EMS Chiefs Committee yesterday. Uh, you know, currently that facility only holds 12 people that can be there for mental health. Uh, there's a pilot program going on right now with the Wheaton Fire Department in Winfield that they're taking those people to that facility for mental health. But we only see that getting worse. And I think the chief will agree that you know, it is difficult each and every day to deal with the mental health in this community. The homelessness, the people that come in on our trains is, you know, getting to be very difficult. Just as for um, staff, the hold is not going to be reflected in the numbers at the end. So it's not added as an expense. No, we're, we've it? got the money for the whole thing. Okay. Yeah. It's one of those where we wanted to make sure before we implement it, kind of like what you had talked about on some of these other high price items that just by virtue of having it in the budget doesn't necessarily mean here it's time to go right away because there's lots of different considerations and so we want to make sure that before we would implement it that'd be something that we'd be discussing with you guys sounds like we're Put having a lot of that discussion right now mm -hmm. but the but the one other oh go ahead mayor sorry no i was going to say it is reflected in that so we don't have to yeah. take away from the police right <laughs> Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. Yeah, I, it is not about think, the do's and don'ts of the program. I appreciate the discussion, but it's about having the money in there to be able to do it. Go. And that's what's important tonight. And one thing I just want to add is if truly this does happen and gets approved, if our third ambulance ever goes down, as you know, Metro Paramedics is our contract medic. They always offer to put an ambulance in our fire station. But I feel funny about that, having an ambulance that's going through our town that Superior. says Metro or Superior. You know, even every time I have to tell the police chief and the manager that an engine's down and we're running a Downers Grove engine and they have to do the same thing, that kind of is embarrassing to me. And it's nothing that the village garage and the maintenance guy do, because I tell you all the time what awesome jobs they do, but it's just, I'm not sure you as a board want to see those vehicles Put running a magnet in, in our town. Yeah, a big magnet on the side. Yeah. <laughs> and, sure. and one thing I just want to say too is, and I know that the mutual aid response is in place for a reason, too. I mean, that goes back more years than I can remember. And I am glad that we do have that as a fallback if we need it. Um, so I just wanted to say that, you know, that, too, that, you. you know, we've got something in place. But I am hoping that we can 
good discussion. This is uh, yeah. So so one thing I will just note in terms of the cost, it is the two hundred fifty thousand dollars right now, and that's what you're all aware of. The other piece of it is part of all this unknown with the fire department. If it's going to cost more to operate the fire department as a full-time department if it ever moves in that direction. And so as we're saying, yes, this is this $250,000 right now, that will balloon by some unknown factor in the future. So just as we know, as we're adding to this, we're adding to our cost to something that in the future we're going to have to be taking a big look and saying, are we able to continue this level of service? What is this cost now impact? So just so we know, it, you know, I think there's good arguments to be made to do it right away, but just know that we're committing not just to this $250,000, but also committing to when we're doing the analysis for what will a full-time department cost, we've upped what that cost will be mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to continue operating at that rate. So when we're going to our residents to say, are you willing to pay more to be able to fund this at a higher program if we need to, or are we looking at cutting services, we're increasing what that cost will be. We don't know what, mm -hmm. by what amount we're increasing that cost, but I just want to make it clear that in addition to the $250,000 that I put on the slide, there's also that X factor that we don't know about yet. Yeah. So just I hear as long you as that's clear. I hear you, Spencer. I think yeah. for my side is it's the right thing to do, the right thing to yep. do now. And since there's no long-term employment obligations, it's a win-win. Yep. You know, and, and in the future, if we just, that extra person, because it's all full-time, now equates to a lot more. That's a, to me, it's a different discussion kind of. We can of have another day. conversation at that point in time. Yep. All right. So do we delete on hold? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I scratched it out. You only so, have to look at the dollar sign. Yeah. You can, uh, the on hold just means when the manager authorizes it. So it sounds like it's going to be soon. It's authorized. Like tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> 7 o'clock tonight. Can I, can I ask what the Write infrared decontamination yeah. chamber is? Oh. Sure. Chief Gunther, do you want to come talk about yeah. that? To Gotta equipment go in shared to between out. police and fire. <laughs> do I glow in the dark? Uh-oh. Great question. So it's much less than two hundred fifty thousand dollars, which the fire department just <laughs> You just get more of them. <laughs> Good yeah. So there's the uh, yeah. Well, I got I got plenty. Um, uh, as you know, we have the DEA fund, and in the DEA fund, that's asset forfeiture uh, money that's seized. So it's not taxpayer money, uh, and uh, we have uh, a list of things that the Department of Justice allows us to spend uh, those funds on. One of the things that we've been using uh, some of the money for in years past is our physical fitness facility, which is in the basement of the police fire facility. And we've made you know, vast improvements and obviously it's a, it's a health and wellness issue for uh, our, both our police and our fire staff. So this $40,000 represents uh, several parts to uh, further improvements, which uh, includes uh, new updated uh, physical fitness equipment as well as a infrared sauna for uh, the police and firefighters. Uh, if you know the, understand the layout of the, of the workout room in the basement, we have the facility, it's all one huge room and half of it's taken up by the fitness equipment and then there's a series of four smaller rooms that were kind of basically glorified closets that the fire department has used over the years uh, since the building was uh, built in 1996. Um, Chief Riley and his staff have um, acquiesced to my uh, request to uh, clear the old stuff out. So they filled up a dumpster and a half uh, in the last month or so and uh, cleared out three of the four rooms. Uh, so the plan is two of the rooms we're going to uh, take down. So facilities will go in and it's just um, basically two by fours and, um, and uh, drywall that'll come down. We'll eliminate two, of the, so we'll increase the floor space for the, the fitness room, and then we'll use the third room uh, as a standalone and put the infrared sauna in that. So you ask why an infrared sauna, and why do we call it an infrared decontamination chamber? <laughs> the, um, uh, th this is, you know, uh, actually in my conversations with the fire department, it is, uh, it is very well used in the fire industry uh, for detoxification. So as you know, firefighters and police, and He's sorry. okay, Larry? Yeah. You're scaring them away with this talk. Yeah, apparently. <laughs> sorry, coming back. It's okay. It's a phone call. Um, so you know the you know fire uh, fire department personnel and police officers are are exposed on a regular basis to to carcinogens, toxic mm -hmm. substances. It gets into their skin, and this is a, a an easy way for eliminating those uh, free radicals in the skin. So um, okay. so you know number one, it's a detoxification uh, for the staff. 
And then there's a lot of health benefits that come along with that, uh, including uh, improving heart health, increasing blood flow, soothing sore muscles, pain relief, relaxation, uh, helping sleep, so sleep patterns, and uh, you know, 24/7 shift work, uh, and then fighting illness. Um, we are um, so we're in the process of of doing all those things. So uh, clearly, this is a little bit more out of the box thinking, um, but you know, in a tough environment for employment, we have to be ahead of the curve and and out of the box thinking for retaining. Uh, staff and this certainly will go uh, one more peg that direction for for bringing people in so how we got the new uh, deputy fire chief from uh, Downers Grove to come over <laughs> <laughs> it's part of the sales introduced. The yes exactly mm -hmm. so is there any uh, questions at this point introduce yes, uh, introduce the uh, like chief Riley didn't introduce his own guy <laughs> so this is deputy chief Tom Frank he's uh, <laughs> 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 the chief yeah soon soon to be <laughs> Not onboarded yet. But He's not onboarded be. yet. He's not getting compensated for this evening that I'm aware of. So he came here on his own free <laughs> volition because it's a public open meeting. Just uh, very happy to have Tom. He, you know, since I was here and I helped interview him, uh, super qualified individual, uh, awesome references, uh, interviewed great, uh, perfect fit for the community. I mean, he's he's one of our people, and we're going to be happy to have him over here, uh, really, really, really soon. So happy to have him on board. Thank you. Thank Chief, you. I got to ask, how big is this sauna? Like, I, I, bought, I, I bought one from Costco and it was 1200 bucks. I'm curious, is this like platinum lined or something? Like, no. what's going on? And I know it's DEA funds, yeah, no, it's, but what's going on in the sauna? I'm kind of jealous. <laughs> it's, it's a multi-part question. Uh, I think the, the sauna, I think it was seven by nine. So infrared is, so there's right. two types. There's, there's infrared and then there's steam. So this is, a, this is electric only, it's infrared. Uh -huh. There's no steam in it, there's no water vapor or anything. So the, there's no plumbing issues. Um, it's a much simpler design. You know, the, the, the function of both steam and infrared is to raise the body temperature, the surface temperature of your skin. I get it. To promote I just, sweating. I've never seen one for 40K unless it's, it's not, going no, in. It's not 40, that's the total amount for the other physical things. Oh, equipment. okay. It's not, yeah, it's not, it's not <laughs> diamond right. plated or. I was know. just wondering. I mean, I know Excellent it's DEA question. funds, but. We're, we're, you know, we have <laughs> a reputation for spending money. Uh, Costco.com, 1200 <laughs> bucks. <laughs> Is that the EMA room? Yeah. What's that? Is that the EMA room? No, EMA room is separate. <laughs> oh, okay. So we, we, we took care of that too. Now. <laughs> so the EMA room is still the EMA room. Uh, there's going to be some fire equipment that's going to be moved, you know, things that they use on a regular basis, power tools and, and whatnot. Um, so we're doing some shifting around for, for um, equipment, but the EMA room will still be intact. Checking. Yeah, good question. <laughs> okay, you can and it's remediated. Yeah. Are we done? Yeah, that's there's, all, <laughs> there's other fitness equipment too. It's not just uh, that chamber. Uh, that's yeah, keep good going, point, Spencer. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Now we get to. We got lots of sidewalks. You're gonna call and Amy up. Mm -hmm. What? You're gonna call, call Amy, Amy up? up? Sure. Yeah. She's if so there's any, excited. In case there's any questions about the sidewalks, so you can see there's quite a few listed there, including at the very bottom, kind of starting the design that will be built in future years. And again, before Amy talked, this has been a priority of this board is to get sidewalks at least on one side of the street. Mm -hmm. In some places, two sides with safety to school, route to school, and also for our residents. So I, I didn't, I didn't anticipate, I didn't uh, warn anybody they would be presenting today. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. None of them but are this infrared, is your budget, but so. <laughs> <laughs> we are getting some applied for some grant money. So um, the STP grant, uh, we've applied for some safe routes money for uh, Westview neighborhood. So that's 250,000 that we would get from um, safe routes to school. We should be finding that out uh, shortly. Um, STP, that's the 59th street portion, the first project that's listed. Um, I don't know if DMMC has taken that up yet uh, in, in their committees, but um, we are hopeful there also. Um, for the Richmond Court 59th Street uh, portion, we do have a lot of broad-based uh, support from a lot of the residents along the route, which is really helpful. Um, and then also some replacements, completing the one um, small piece on Wilmette uh, that is a continuation of this past summer Van Industrial Drive and then starting some additional design for um, some other areas. Again, the Newfield Manor sidewalk that had some controversy now is in, and we don't hear anything. And we're not going back there in this. Well, we're not going the back there now. in this 20 months. Yeah. No. 
<laughs> I need a, I need a rest from. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, is, is our safe step funds in uh, the annual sidewalk replacement for like uh, grinding that's in, uh, um, in the O&M side. Okay. But this is like um, some replacements that are not eligible for safe step, just so that we can get ahead of it. We do some of it in-house, but we do have a really long backlog, and we're trying to keep on top of it. So safe step's in here somewhere? We it's just in haven't the O&M yet? budget. Yeah. Okay. This is okay. capital. Is the van industrial due to the changes in the park? on south side of 63rd street no there's not any sidewalk there and there's a lot of like vehicle parking that occurs that's like blocking a, the sidewalk route and so trying to get that in there to uh better define the pedestrian pathway yeah, i can add to that spot. a little bit too it, it's actually been in there several years and the two-thirds of the sidewalk exists on the east side of the street and then along the the bus they weren't and they were they were all they were employee parking out on the gravel parkway and everything plus it's a long straight flat mm -hmm. easy one to do so we've used this we've kind of kept it for in-house opportunities and not contracted out so yep. okay. that's what that is it's not urgent but it's a good project yep. to finish anybody from the audience on sidewalk no I'm Once the public sees the list, we'll and see the next Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Aren't Entire gonna, neighborhoods of people. Aren't you going to run around our neighborhood and tell everybody? <laughs> I, I, I love, you know I love sidewalks. I'm yeah. just teasing. I, well, we all need sidewalks. I don't understand the, the pushback on sidewalks. Yeah. All right. You stay up there. We're rolling. Yeah, I mean, we'll stick around for a while. Got lots Chair. of infrastructure coming up. So these are some of the roads and alleys, including the resurfacing. That's two years worth of MFT resurfacing. And then it lists the different alleys that we're working on and the pavement study. And we, somebody's here for the alley and come on up. And the, um, some of these won't start till spring next year, but you might have to answer a question. I'm Judy Woodleckner. I'm at 151 Park Street. Um, I know they've been working diligently on resurfacing the alleys and trying to solve the water problems but we have a major one between Hudson and Park it floods all the time it was uh, paved at one point behind our house but um, over the years the, you know the village has put in um, probably about three feet of stone on top of it all because the garbage trucks come through but when the county did Naperville Road over, which I think was about nine years, six to nine years ago, they took this major grade out that was up at the driveway side that took the overflow from, you know, Naperville Road. Now all that water comes in. The storm sewer that's on my property, um, the village street department put in an eight inch sleeve hoping to solve the issues with it leaking um, somewhere on the property. The, the sump pump is going constantly and it you know recirculates everything back out to the alley and it doesn't take the flow so I'm concerned because I understand from a couple people that I've heard from the street department that they might not approve the you know uh, continued um, improvements to these alleys but ours is one of the lowest ones because it's down at the bottom of the hill at Park Street when you come down Naperville Road and it's a big concern because there's a lot of freestanding water sometimes it can be two feet deep when the you know ruts occur and it is about a 20 foot hole of water and the kids play in it we get mosquitoes breeding i mean it's a mess and it just dried up monday from the little bit of rain that we've actually had and yet you know the sump pump is still going so there's issues there that i just want to you know bring it to you folks attention so that hopefully you know you'll still continue to improve these because I, I don't even know where that alley falls with the way you've yeah, got these numbers be happy to know your alley's got a name and it's 10 north okay <laughs> right. <laughs> right. thank you at least I'll know what to watch but I just wanted to bring it to your attention that it is a, a big issue and this has been ongoing for 30 years I mean we had village meetings you'll probably mm -hmm. remember Marie years ago where we had you know people from Wilmette and all kinds of areas that had issues and they were slowly addressing it and I feel like we're kind of at the end of the list here but it'd be nice to know that we can get this resolved eventually that is uh, public works director Amy Reese and I'll fill her in later about uh, just the history of your location Thank you. and the good news is that our staff's been talking to you and trying to help you so Amy would be the perfect one to 
sit down with. Hey, Nick, Steve, so if it can, is, can you explain what the other three alleys are? I just can't remember. Mm, that they're cryptic no. names here. Maybe. I know 10 North now because you just said it. Yeah. The other two. I know yeah, the other so two are South. How five about South that? is actually like right over here between Adams and Washington on the South side. Um, that is where the NICOR relocations are going on right now. Oh, okay. So Got it. Uh, that's kind of the, the pandemonium over there. Um, so that one will be constructed this summer. And then the next one is, must be two blocks over then. Yeah, seven <laughs> south. Yeah, is two blocks over from that. So their condition is monitored. Two blocks which way? Um, seven is this way to the east of the one that. Are they numbered consecutively or are they? Or is yeah, they start the out like one is the one right behind here, and then um, two, and three, mm -hmm. and then four. So, oh, so, so it might be the next one, though. The odds are on the south oh. side. So seven is west of five? Seven is, um, yes. yes. Okay, thank you. And that's, what, it, what is the construction Hudson? method? Are we talking brick alleys or? No, for the residential alleys, that there is a. Um, concrete curb and asphalt. Yeah, the concrete or straining curb and the asphalt. So very similar to what's behind here. Yeah, okay. So is, is seven, I just don't, didn't follow it, so sorry to ask, but seven, is that Washington? Seven is, no, it's, what's after? I still don't remember all the streets. Thinking Adams, Grant Washington. Adams. Yeah, it's two out from the one that is there now. I got, okay, so Grant Adams, Washington, okay. And those are always like kind of fun because there's NICOR in the alleys and they cannot direction, the main is too high. So when they core out the alley to build the stone base and the asphalt pavement section, mm -hmm. they can't um, directionally bore through all the stone that's in there, like because all the sanitary trenches are in there. So what they are mess. moving all the mains out into the front. Wow. So I've got Google Maps up on the screen. I don't know if that's helpful. Yeah. Like, Anybody? I just looked on think, my phone. Yeah, think about yeah. where we are. So. One. Yeah. So Park and Hudson. Park and Hudson. Okay. It's like the second to last one. It's seven. Yep. It's seven, yeah. All right. So it's a exciting. Ten and then it's action. I think right now the plan is to do the design in the eight month budget, to do the engineering, and then be able to construct it in the twelve month yeah, budget. Yeah, next summer, yep. This gentleman had a question. Oh, got a question here. I know this is going back a little bit, but to the to the um, point of the sidewalks, I just want to give my thanks to the Public Works Department. I am on the portion of uh, Wilmet that was done last year, and I know that there was, um, in the planning stages, there was a, a significant amount of trees that were kind of marked for being in the way, and I want to thank you guys for your creative thinking, and you know, now when we walk down the street, we still see those trees with the pink X's on them, and <laughs> we're, we're grateful they're still there, so <laughs> I would hope that um, you're able to continue that. Um, in, in your expansion. Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks. Right. We can move on, Spencer. All right. Next one shows some of our lighting projects um, coming up and included on here again, similar to the other slide. Lots of these are big dollar amounts because they're big infrastructure projects, but we do have listed on here the smaller, comparatively smaller, $5,000 dark sky rebate program. That's just a continuation of an initiative that the EIC started. I think it's been going on this year as well, so it's continuing on to be able to give grants to residents who are trying to become more dark sky compliant. Oh, I would ask if we had the opportunity to expand that to uh, commercial businesses as well. They're both problematic as far as dark sky. Mm -hmm. And it would be nice to have something in there to steer them. It helps the DIP program, but it also would steer some of these people to take advantage <coughs> of that and make this change happen a little bit quicker. You know, instead of 50 years, maybe we knock it down to 45. Sure, we could certainly add some additional money for that for a commercial side. Deer Creek, is that the one in Downers on 55th Street? No, we have a Deer Creek off 59th. Oh, 59th. By Twin Lakes but Golf Course. Mm -hmm. Near Fairview, they're it's where Mulhars next live. to each other. Oh, okay. That's where Mulhars is. 
<laughs> yeah. Any specific amount that you know we want to try to include in there for the commercial or just? So how much of the? Just make sure it applies to both. Yeah. How much but, of the five thousand was used, right? Larry, do you recall how much of the five thousand was used for the dark sky rebate program? So for the recording purposes, that's four grants, about half of that $5,000 spent. Yeah. So if it, you know, if it was 10 grand, sure. uh, hopefully people will take advantage of it. We could advertise it, let them know it's available, and we'd see some changes, hopefully, for the yeah. better. So a total of 10 grand? For the plan. Move it from five up to 10? I think so. It's a good sure. start, right? <laughs> yep. Okay. Then we've got some of our stormwater items listed, the upcoming ones. Just a couple of those. And then into the water. So we've got several water mains listed here. And hey Spencer, just real quick on stormwater. Yep. Sure. Is it safe to say that all these projects are funded uh, primarily from our stormwater fund? Other than yes. maybe other grants or anything we get. Yep. Good, good news for on that front also. Um, for the Oakmont project, the county is going to also be chipping in on that. So we're uh, awaiting confirmation of that, but um, we had a very nice Been conversation waiting. with. Uh, do we have anybody that represents us? Maybe if we county? had a good representative, you would have got an okay on that. Trustee <laughs> Nero. No, I think, it, I think it was 500. That's what I heard. Is, is yep. That's what they're both. Okay. So, yeah. So um, good. we're pretty excited about that. Good, good, that's great. Yeah, so other than the grant from the county, yes, these are all funded from our stormwater fund, which comes from that stormwater sales tax that the residents voted in several years ago. Mm -hmm. That is not just funded by residents. That was Jim Addington's idea, Mary. Remember that? Yeah, yeah. That was brilliant. The last minute it was Jim Addington that night, we switched. Yeah, that's right. Yep. He didn't switch a rule, yeah. <laughs> Yep, so we list the water mains and then some of the other uh, major capital expenses in the water fund. We'll go into a lot more detail on this on our May 16th meeting at the Admin Finance Committee meeting. We're having the presentation of our water rate study. Okay. And so they'll be talking about all of our very significant capital needs and how we're going to be taking care of that. So this budget includes some of those assumptions from the water rate study. So depending on what we end up deciding on the water rate study, we wanted to make sure that the budget has enough in it to be able to include the things that are being requested. So I will note on this, these expenses, the first one that's listed there, that $6 million for the water tower, that's funded by the IEPA loan, which is a very low interest loan. And there's about $1.6 million worth of loan forgiveness as well. So $6 million worth of expenses, we're getting the cash, we'll be reimbursed the cash and then have to pay back $4 million of that over a period of time at low interest. In addition to that, the water rate study plan calls for about $7 million worth of bonds to be able to help cover these expenses listed here and the ones coming up for the next couple of years. So we'll talk more about that in detail, but just wanted to let you know right now the plan is what's included in the budget is an assumption that we're going to be going into about 11 some million dollars worth of debt between the IEPA and the bonds in the water fund. And, and two things. One is, in order to do all these in a timely manner, you need bonds up front to do it, just like we did the roads and just like we yep. did with um, um, stormwater and the public works building. This also assumes um, a gradual rate increase, and that's what you're going to talk about, because I think the board during COVID froze the water rates and I think that's reflected now on some of the things we need to do yep that's very true yep so that's a great could you put that back on your own preview mm -hmm. yeah any questions on water yeah no. yes um, sorry sorry I'll go back so uh, I don't know if Amy wants to run back up there whether well, she is right <laughs> She's right there. Um, so she hasn't left. the 290 that we're spending here, the lead services, mm -hmm. is that making a small dent in the problem we have? So um, the IEPA is requiring us to replace 7% a year so until they're gone. And so that's a estimated number representing 7% a year. Um, we do have some 
money in the budget every year to accommodate some um, like voluntary replacements. So people that contact us that want to undertake it, you know, with their own contractor, and we would reimburse them. And we also have lead replacements built into the water main project. So if there's any um, lead services on the water main projects, those are also uh, replaced during the project. Um, These are to cover the ones we wouldn't be on that block otherwise. Yeah. Yep. And so like there, you know, and you, the, you don't have to go into any detail. Oh. I just, I just want to know that this is just a small piece of it. Yeah. It doesn't yep. solve the problem. And then the other one is, so they just did a, a thing with these forever chemicals. PFAS. Does, yeah. Yeah. Yep. Now does that have a implication for us coming down the road? It doesn't. More so, restrictions. Yeah. It doesn't more, so much for us because we don't make water. We are, we already, we buy already finished water from Chicago essentially yeah, does, does that um, mean it's going up because they're gonna treat it they don't have it it's not as prevalent in the surface waters as it is in like a, a groundwater source but it is a concern um, and it is something it's they're very difficult to remove so it is something that could potentially drive costs in the future okay is there any indication what were the increase going to be from Chicago um, right now I think it was 5.83 for the calendar this year? Yeah, for May, the May 1 increase um, from DuPage Water Commission. They did sign a, a continuation of the contract with Chicago um, in 20 year. Kind of see how that goes. Um, there was Cent or like dollars per gallon, thousand gallons? Per thousand gallons. Okay. Yeah. Yep. So, which was a little bit less than we, we were thinking it was going to be. So that was good. Um, there's Cause, also cause the county started saying we're going to go around the city. Yeah, well, <laughs> they, they sharpen their pencil. They're still saying it's, that. Yeah, they're, they're still good. saying that. I think once that Prairie State Water Commission, the uh, Joliet uh, group, goes comes online, they're getting a really favorable rate from Chicago. And once that is revealed, like what that rate is going to be, then we will also get that rate. Is that direct That's from wrong. Chicago okay. to Joliet? It's yeah. not branching off anywhere. They're going to run. Um, it's going from Chicago to Joliet. I think Shorewood. Um, there's a few other communities that, that yeah, it's going through okay. that are going to be joining that uh, Prairie State Water. <coughs> <coughs> Any other comments on water? Did you want to now, Nick? I got something. Yeah, just just uh, I just wanted to kind of regroup here and again. Uh, you, you, you went through the normal budget discussions you have going over the individual projects, and I think that's good discussion. But this is what you got to be familiar with and be comfortable with. So if you could just uh, spend a little time with that, make sure you're comfortable with the eight-month budget, the 12-month, the expenses are listed there, and that's really what we're asking you to, uh, to vote on and to adopt. So uh, any questions on that, just uh, call one of us or call the manager. And, uh, but this is essentially what we're asking you to vote on. And approve. I think we had good good discussion on all this. I'm glad you presented it project by project, uh, so we can talk about it. Anybody have any questions in the audience? No. Anything else, Spencer? Nick? So really, just that's the list of the next steps. So we're approving both budgets on the second. We'll do the eight month appropriation. Then we'll do the next steps for the 12 month as we get closer to. That time period. Um, so I think the one change we're making in the budget is increasing dark sky from 5,000 to 10,000. Um, I think that was the specific action item we identified. Other questions? Any last statements from anybody? Yeah, of course. Sure. Sorry. Um, I'm assuming that everybody's taking a look at staffing and needs and stuff like that. Can somebody just tell us a little bit about the staff shortages that we're experiencing? Are we, uh -oh, we've chief. got holes to fill, right? <laughs> Two chiefs just yes, jumped Yes, I up. will say <laughs> we definitely we have up. holes to fill. Um, I think, you know, the more people we can get in both our police and fire, Public I think orders. the better, obviously. I think those are the ones that are kind of the tightest in general. I, I will say we're seeing some positive signs. I know for some of our other positions, we've got quite a few applications, and I know what we saw for our test for police is better than we've seen for a while. So I'll let you. Correct. Thanks for the question. It's uh, you know, you know we're we're authorized to go up to 41. We're currently at 34. We just onboarded uh, two more officers last week, uh, with one that just graduated the academy last week as well. So um, 
you, we have 34. We only have 31 operational because those three are, are either in field training or going to the academy. Uh, so we are, you know, in the process of hiring six to seven. Uh, we just completed uh, a lateral entry list where we have 15 names uh, currently on it. They take their written test on Monday. Uh, so hopefully we can get you know several people off of the lateral list. We have a second list, which is an initial eligibility list, and we should have probably about 150 to 170 applicants uh, that could be in the pipeline for going through the process. So you know, staffing shortage is still down on the police side, uh, but we're making some positive gains, getting back to where we need to be. And Amy should have came back up. How are you at Public Works? <laughs> I think we're filling Come up, it. but they're filling. We're filling a, a planner right and a director of finance now. So we're get, we're getting the finance people. Director, right? We're seeing people apply. Yeah, that's a big plus. Renee can come up too. Talk to staff overall. Go for it, Amy. Okay. Yep. Yeah, we just uh, this week had two um, new employees start in the underground division. Um, they're doing really well so far. We're really excited to be here. Um, participated, uh, really added to the crew on the water main break that was uh, occurring last night. Um, so we're happy to have them. We have another one starting next week in the forestry unit, and we are poised to make an offer to another water operator. So um, we're doing pretty well on the operation side, um, getting all those vacancies filled. Um, and then in addition to that, um, as was mentioned, we do have um, several candidates kind of in the background process in the pipeline. Um, as was mentioned earlier, Tom Frank will be joining us on May 13th. Um, we do also have the finance director candidate and background process, so anticipating his start, as um, was mentioned, hopefully at the end of May. Um, and then we are currently recruiting for a building inspector code enforcement officer position, um, and we're kind of closing out seasonal hires as well. So um, we're making good progress um, in terms of the positions that are open and have historically been open. And we still have a couple items that were in last year's budget that um, were requested and then we're kind of working towards filling them. There's a part-time position in governmental services and then there's still a part-time administrative position in public works. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. So I do have one more on a different topic. So I, I, I struggle, you know, as adding up the sidewalk numbers and we've got about $2 million in sidewalk in neighborhoods. I don't know where it is, you know, it's, it's somewhere, but it certainly should be somewhere. Um, sidewalk, I, I don't think that we should have a single piece of sidewalk in the CBD that's a tripping hazard. Mm -hmm. um, so that should be in there somewhere. I don't know what that dollar amount is. But we also talked about the bricks down there and the need for brick repair, and we had everybody from staff come up and say that it's terrible, it needs to be fixed. I don't know if that's in here, but I think it should be. And I would be willing to take the, you know, $2.5 million off of Quincy and put it in the CBD on Cass Avenue. That's how I feel that I understand that we're planning, planning, and planning, but in the meantime, our downtown walkways there are problematic. Our electric down there is problematic. Um, the bricks are problematic from end to end. Um, I saw, I think, Woodridge and both Woodridge and Downers Grove put in brick um, crosswalks. Mm -hmm. And, it, you know, it's, it's, it's nice. It's attractive and it, it magnifies that area so that you know it's an intersection. We always, str you know, struggle with that. You know, people crossing mid block um, and those markings. And I think those kinds of things um, take forever to do because you have the permissions and stuff like that. But I'm, I'm saying if we don't start now, and we start five years from now, we're not going to see any change for 10 years. So those are, you know, the, the bricks. I, you know, I was out here for the uh, waste collection out here, and I looked at this area over here. There's a little bit of concrete curbing problem. There's a tremendous uh, sinking brick problem. But other than that, the parking lot is in great shape. Mm -hmm. So I'm going. I, I don't know, you know, I'm, I'm uncomfortable. It's, uh, you know, the board is a vote, obviously, but uh, I'm uncomfortable putting 2.5 over here when we haven't addressed that. And if we added up the spend on Cass Avenue right there, and we could go all the way down to Dallas and all the way up to Chicago Avenue or beyond and make that look like it should. Yeah. That's, that's my 
yeah. take. I'll go first to the seventy-five thousand. Um, yeah. The brick, yeah. So we have um, fifty thousand for the eight month and twenty-five for the um, twelve months to address the brick areas. We've already gone through and inventory the areas that need attention. Um, we've actually we bought a brick saw so we can start fixing those. Um, is, it, is that a repair of what we have or is it a replacement? It's it's going to be probably both. Um, I talked to a colleague of mine in Naperville about this. They just recently did a con a contract to have a contractor replace all the bricks. So I got all their documents, all their bid tabs. Um, talked to him a little bit about lessons learned. Um, the salt actually ate a lot of the bottoms of the bricks. So when they pulled them out, they had to end up replacing more of them than they anticipated, just because of like all the salt eating them. Um, and I've also, I'm constantly, in, in all of us really in the apartment are constantly on the lookout of like other towns and what they're doing, how they're doing it, yeah. how they're like, we talked about modifying some of the tree boxes to make sure that they, trees don't heave the, the bricks up again, you know, how we can better have like a base under the bricks so that they don't um, settle as bad. Um, taking the bricks out in some of the spots if it's just not a good Right, and that's a reduce the issue, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's just not a good application. And also trying to like figure out what the, where the line is that, you know, getting it so that it's um, safe and attractive in this interim period while we're doing streetscape planning, while we're doing the master plan, and back to, um, you know, part of the master plan process is what we're gonna do, I, I, where I we're gonna just, start, you yeah. know, how far we're gonna go. Right. I would just ask that it wouldn't be hodgepodge because mm -hmm. we're, you know, as a municipality, we're always planning, right? Yeah. So that's the buzzword, right? We're, we're planning and we're yep. always planning and things are gonna change and we're gonna adapt and overcome, but it, it shouldn't be a hodgepodge. And then if, if we are interested at, you know, Woodridge and Downer Scrove thought it was a good idea to put those brick uh, mm -hmm. crosswalks in. And if we're gonna do that, I'm saying, I'm bringing it to you today, you've seen it. Mm -hmm. And then it's going to take us five years to get that actually to happen. Yeah, and that's why I, I don't like kicking it down the road. Yeah, right? and that that's why the the money's in there for like the master planning process, just to make sure that we have right. But that's a that's kind plan. of a no brainer, right? And Though then we've got to can afford it. You know, possibly developer activity downtown that we want to make sure we're not too far ahead of ourselves in some of those areas there's, too. A, there's a lot of factors you know? so but. it's it's a it's it's a hard balancing act but what, um what if we um since we have an on hold still on the table we didn't use what if we put uh, put this quincy on hold to give us time maybe for the plan to come in and and maybe take a look at it at that point and make sure we're making the right decision because i'm kind of with bruce and i've said this before like a, I don't like the hodgepodge idea, and B, if we're going to prioritize funding, I'm going to go with downtown over Quincy all day long just because it's it's due, mm -hmm. you know? It has to be safe, but then after that, mm -hmm. I think it's, be wrong. you know. Quincy, I you may know? be wrong, but I think that's in conjunction with the depot and realigning the, am I wrong? I thought it was further down. Is they're gonna, when are they going to start? It would go see? all the way down. Oh, the next part would be this, you know, right Lincoln, in front of Village two Hall. blocks. You know, I'm not saying not do it, Our just not right now, you know, let's... They did a year, but when they do the depot, that's when you want to do... They'll do the depot and they'll do inside and they're doing platform repairs. Okay. So do you, do you, you don't want to be doing both projects at the same time. So we can wait until... We I mean, how long have we been waiting on Metro for that now? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Is that really happening? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We have a, actually, we have, we have a meeting about it tomorrow, so yeah. we'll yeah. see how that goes. And they're like, and I hate to even mention this too, but we got that whole underpass scenario going right. on, right. and we're looking at preliminary ICC programming for six million dollars for that. So for, from the ICC contributing yeah. to that, I almost so. think you got to get that it's, settled mm -hmm. and done before we blow it all up. And that um, that's a, a a big question mark, and we've talked internally too about whether. You know, we need to do the front of this building for the ADA accessibility um, and ADA parking, and whether we do kind of a slim down version addressing those issues, some of the condition issues and aesthetic issues, but more of a light facelift, and then save the big guns for that main drag on Cass. So. I, I like that. <laughs> but Amy, how much is, 
when you talk about a plan for master plan for downtown how much is too much to put into it other than safety because you might change everything with the new plan yeah it's it's more so the way like these are done a lot of times is they identify like these zones so they'll say and joe probably has seen this too where they pick like this is the most intense area mm -hmm. and this is where the most treatments are going to be the most you know bells and whistles and then as they work out from where that main core is the type of treatments change a little bit so they either become less intense they become um more uh what's the word i'm looking for it's like more pedestrian ways and in less commercial there'll be there'll be like gateway features so just try, try to identify some of that stuff and figure out where we're doing it where our limits are where we're starting and stopping when we start transitioning to residential where our the intensity of the streetscape treatment will transition also into that um residential area but we're work you know we're working with that uh, contractor that did quincy street right we're still working with them yeah. we have a relationship yep. And that's, I'd almost like to turn the conversation to have a more intense conversation about Cass mm -hmm. and have them help us because that, is, you know, Cass Avenue is our street, right? That is our street. Uh, and have a more intense conversation with them about where's, the, you know, we did this at where I work, right? We hired a, you know, pre construction, we hired a contractor, we had them figure out where the stopping and starting was and where there was a clean break and all of that. Uh, and engage people in that so that we understand it more clear at the very beginning and then you know the whole point is that there shouldn't be any safety hazards down there mm -hmm. and it shouldn't be a hodgepodge because it's that important to us i feel you on the hodgepodge so yeah. well but i so, so that's what we <laughs> yeah. don't want right and you get it mm -hmm. it's just a question of how can we move it quicker rather than our usual process where it, we plan and plan and then we check and then we plan right? Amy Lee I just have a clarifying question so this money that's in here for Quincy streetscape is is this more than just like the plan like do we already have the plan no this no this so is this is plan and implementation yeah, there is, is no plan where because like the other one says like we're just getting a plan so I just want to yeah make sure that's just a plan so there is there's no actual plan yet this is plan and construction so you for Quincy Street scale. so do you remember when we had like the workshop in here and people put the post-it notes up and they showed you all these different ideas yeah it had the the island, workshop the island park was yeah, part of yep, that, which and, and the different things so that that number there is the construction number for that process that you saw uh, so right like so I, I guess my point is like have we already paid for planning for that that now we're going to put on hold that that plan will no longer be good when we come back to it so i i, I guess that's the part that i just want to make sure i'm understanding like are we putting something on hold that we've already paid for that may not, go stale uh, not we, we paid for preliminary concept okay so, so there's no construction plans okay no but that concept that could go stale by the time we turn not, back you know, to it. or right it's an a, the it's style a might aesthetic change. right so you might have a different opinion when we get ready to mm. do that so okay. anybody else safety first All right, so in terms of action plan then, I think we talked about the dark sky increase, and then we've got a few items that we have, I've got on my list that talk to the board about before we actually implement them. So that's the West Quincy streetscape, so before we're doing more expenses on that, the strategic plan and the marketing and branding study. And then make sure we've got room in our appropriation ordinance to cover additional in the downtown incentive program in case that's something that we want to do going forward. Mm -hmm. then right. go back downtown That's we're talking about brick uh, walkways is that did you put that one in where the pedestrian cross there by um, the Knights is that, that got to have approval from the county or no That's no right. I mean that's in our control the design and do but you know for example it was put in and I, I don't want to call it temporary but we just marked it and did you know ADA ramps to do that but uh, when it when you get to a point where you're doing the streetscape where you're going in the North Cass and physical improvements you would have the curb 
come out and squeeze all that to you know make it more pedestrian friendly and then if you're going to be doing that not you know all the points taken tonight but if we spend two million dollars raising this same bricks we have or doing that which is which is needed but then we'll be digging that all out if we're going to be doing another problem but that's where you got to is that one year two years five years or ten years and you don't know so um, it, that's the balance how much do you want to invest in maintenance of what's there versus oh. make it by versus improving it yeah right and then the development on the corner right I mean how long did you hear when are we going to resurface that intersection at, you know at, uh, at you, Burlington yeah you've been putting that off for years <laughs> yeah, yeah. well we got it done and we, we fit it in there but you did. We're, now we're talking about you know working on the s curve that was all part of that rationale so if there's going to be big stuff happening on that corner we shouldn't be investing big money on that corner that doesn't apply to that improvement mm -hmm. in my mind only right but if if a developer comes in and they want to put something there we should be able to tell them what we want mm -hmm. rather than we just yes. get what they give us and that's the streetscape plan yeah. and the master planning for what right. we want and Joe will say the same thing actually it started with Quincy station is they had a different plan for what to do out front and then we were like we're thinking of something else don't do any of your stuff right you know well but I mean I've seen your drawings over the years I have a plan for this and all this planning gets deferred because we're unsure of is it going to change hopefully it'll change but it'll change for the better and so. I do think though when it's safety and that was your first point that right. uh, that we should spend whatever is necessary for the safety aspect. no that was a good point and that was actually his safe stuff question about grinding and doing things and making them pedestrian safe we, that doesn't get put off we're trying to keep up with that but it's the the aesthetic part yeah. you know that we're well but the, we'll say the, the CBD sidewalks and stuff that bricks are problematic and are you know we have some beautiful alleys right and we spend a lot of money to get them and they're serving the people of the town I've been working on that since 1990 well, well that, that's my point <laughs> yeah. yeah that's my point well, I'm wondering too if maybe this Our downtown game. streetscape plan like director Reese said maybe they'll come back with hey zone a or however they refer to it. I mean I just learned that now hearing her say that and that might give us focus on this area right now because here's a good solution to do it that might alleviate that all those other factors to be involved I don't know I've never seen it how to step it out yeah yeah because I, I just there's got to be a way to do it you know right. I mean I just I'm with you though on we, it, need a, we need to have a lot more conversation about it mm -hmm. that starts right now hopefully so. we all feel <laughs> important right no you've been saying that and I think it's a good point we've got to get the plan done sooner and later so we can start implementing zone a or zone whatever a. yeah but it's in conjunction with the entire plan it might come back saying you got to do it all good luck I know, right now <laughs> Yeah. Any anybody in the audience? Um, anything else? If not, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn, Little. Second, Nero. Motion been made and second to adjourn. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 I want to thank everyone. This meeting is adjourned. Two and a half.